uh, overflow rooms. We have translation. Is that correct? Yes. We do have a translation, so if there's anyone who needs translation, knows of anyone who needs translation, the devices are up here. Please come forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. I know you've been waiting here for 40 minutes. Please, so we can start our meeting, we have quorum now. Shh. Okay, welcome to the Energy, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice Committee. Mr. Clerk, can you please call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Ms. Martinez is here. Mr. Koretz is here. And Mr. O'Farrell is here. You have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Members, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have a number of items today. And I'm, so I'm going to ask, uh, there's over 147 speakers signed up for today's discussion. So I'm going to remind individuals who signed up for general public comment, you'll be allotted one minute. Individuals who signed up for specific items will be allotted one minute for a total of up to two minutes. And individuals who signed up for multiple items and general public comment will be allotted three minutes. So depending on how we go, because I know other members need to go to other committees, um, if we're not getting through speakers quickly enough, then I'm going to have to probably limit that um, to about an hour, an hour and a half. So what I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start with multiple speaker cards. Mr. Spindler, can you please come up? Armando Herman, Corey Smith, and Mike Greenspan. If you hear your name, please come to room 1010. Oh, I'm so sorry. Before you do that, before you do that, Mr. Spindler, hold on for just a second. Mr. Bonin. Thank you for reminding me, Mr. O'Farrell. I know you've got to get to your own committee as well, sir, so I want to give you that opportunity to go ahead. If I can, please. I know there's a lot of people in the room. We want to hear every speaker, so if you can please keep your voices down, I'd really appreciate that. Go ahead, Mr. Bonin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Um, good to be here with you today. You have a lot of speakers today, so I will try to be brief. I'm here to talk about uh, two issues which are important to uh, really the survival of our children and regarding an implementation of a Green New Deal here in Los Angeles. That's items number one and number three. Uh, item number one, as you know, is the uh, Stand LA proposal, which at its core is an effort to create a reasonable buffer between where people live, work, and play and where toxic oil and gas well oper operations are located. Uh, I think it's very important that we start from, from the beginning with, with the, the very clear evidentiary um, uh, analysis that says that fossil fuels like oil and gas are dangerous to extract from the earth. They are dangerous to store near our homes, and they're dangerous to burn when doing so poisons our air and, and dooms future generations. Uh, you will hear today personal stories of people who live near extraction in our, in, here in Los Angeles, which is the largest urban oil field in the nation. Uh, you will hear their stories about how kids are getting sick. You will hear uh, the, the impacts that they suffer with. And I think that evidence will show that we should not allow oil and gas wells near where our kids are sleeping, where they're going to school, and where people go to seek medical attention. Um, it is not only within our jurisdiction, but I believe uh, it is our imperative and our obligation to protect people from the dangerous oil and gas wells. Uh, and we can do that with this legislation. Uh, I understand today is just the beginning of a discussion, so I appreciate that. I do want to note that um, uh, you know, we finally got the report from the Petroleum Administrator. I think there are some interesting things in that, but I think there's, there, there's, there's a sort of a fatal flaw in it, in that it, it creates sort of a, a, a financial analysis of the impact of this. And I, and I do not think that that financial analysis is well grounded. It's based on the presumption that if we uh, shut down oil and gas operations in our neighborhood, that that results in a taking. I certainly do not think, and I think that, that you'll hear from NRDC and others, that, that not allowing somebody to sicken or kill our kids and our seniors is, is tantamount to a taking. I think it is tantamount to actually uh, um, using our police powers and making sure that the people uh, in our neighborhoods uh, are, are not, not sick. I'd like to switch to item number three, which is a separate item but is somewhat related. Uh, it is about uh, an oil or a gas storage facility in my district in Playa del Rey, not far from LAX and not far from residential neighborhoods. Um, 
Uh, neighbors near this facility are understandably concerned about the health and safety impacts of this facility, which has been there for generations, since the 1950s. Uh, routinely, they uh, suffer impacts from this. Uh, there, are, there are flares, there are smells, there, there are all sorts of impacts from this that, that people have been dealing with. Uh, the Playa del Rey gas storage facility is, is a smaller, but a, a even more poorly located version of the Aliso Canyon site that we're all so familiar with, the setting for the worst environmental catastrophe in the history of California. Five-year anniversary of that one will be tomorrow. Um, this facility is, is very similar to that smaller, but it's actually in, as I said, a much worse location. Uh, it is really surrounded by a residential neighborhood. It is right uh, within the, the, the shadow of, of LAX uh, and, and LMU. And in a, a study published a, a year or two ago, the California Council on Science and Technology said that this facility had a history of problems. It said that due to its proximity to a large population center, to the region's largest airport, and to a very high wildfire hazard zone, it presents, and I quote, a higher risk to health and safety than other similar facilities. We need to heed this warning and do our due diligence to make sure this facility is safe. The motion before you today um, asks various city departments to conduct a comprehensive site review, including a careful look at all the equipment and wells on site, a review of the conditions specified by the city's permits, and a compliance check for adherence to the approved zoning and use conditions, as well as uh, remediation of, of subsidence and erosion issues, compliance with the new state gas storage rules, and compliance with any and all facility and operational requirements from the various and, and disparate oversight agencies. You know, my feeling is we need to get off all fossil fuels as soon as humanly possible with a just transition, but as soon as humanly possible. And I believe in my bones that this facility needs to be shut down. That is not our decision to make. That's under the decision of the state. Uh, and our petroleum administrator, Uduak, will soon be in a position to, to make that happen. Um, and I look forward to that. But in the meantime, uh, we do have some responsibility to make sure that the site is operating uh, in accordance with every possible regulation and every possible safety standard um, that we have on the books. So I'd ask for your support for item number three. Uh, and look forward to continued rigorous discussion of item number one so uh, we can uh, protect the residents of Los Angeles and our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonnie. <laughs> so I will go ahead and uh, call up Wayne Spindler, Armando Herman, Corey Smith, and Mike Greenspan. And you can please all make your way up. Madam President? Yes, uh, Mr. Karatz. Uh, if I could note that Mr. Spindler was talking throughout Mr. Bonin's testimony, it was very difficult for I was to not hear. saying anything. Your last and final warning, Mr. Spindler. No. Is Mike Greenspan here? Oh, shit, uh, he's man. Over at the county. Oh, so. he's over at the county. Okay. Yeah. Somebody pull out a card for him. How about uh, um, Antonia Ramirez? Is she at the county, too? Anybody know? All right. So we'll go ahead, uh, go ahead Wayne Spindler. You've got your, you've just. You've filled out cards for all items, including Good. general public comment. Good. Good afternoon, cunt. Now, we get to number one, and we have all of these oil drilling. Certain staffers of years know what oil drilling is, but I know what oil drilling is. And the oil drilling is this. You can't stop us from drilling oil. We're going to keep drilling and drilling and drilling and pumping that gas into that fucking air, into your cars. That's right, because I go over to the states east of us, Arizona and Nevada would pay a dollar twenty-five less a gallon. So uh, we suck up all the poison, and they get all the benefits, as it should be. Because you motherfuckers vote like fools. So that's why you can continue to be gassed while we gas America to move forward. Yes, and you heard from the Bonin foo, the little homeless faggot turned council member talking about wonderful shit that will never exist in our lifetime. No, sir. Playa Del Rey's always been an oil field, and it's going to be an oil field to the day we all die in 150 years beyond that, because that's what we do. We drill on the beach.
speech, and soon, thank God, when Donald Trump gets elected, we'll be doing it in the Santa Monica Bay Fair. We're going to drill for oil everywhere to lower the price per gallon so Mr. Koretz can drive his dream SUV. Now, right now, everybody drives SUVs. At that poor little Jew's got to drive his little choo-choo train electric hybrid because gas is so expensive. And he has to pretend to be a liberal. But I drive an SUV 12 cylinder where I get nine gallons per mile. That's right. And I pay more for my gas. That's right. And little, little Miss Nuri, when you're not looking, she got a big SUV. And Mitchell Fell got a big SUV. And her Wilson got the Biggest 12 cylinder motherfucking truck you ever seen. But you don't know that when you're on television, you're in your electric car, but when you're in the back seat with your hull on Van Nuys Boulevard, you got to have that 12 cylinder symphony under your ass to get out past the police. So I say yes to drill it out. Finally, who's going to go to jail first of these three motherfuckers? Price, Cooper, Waterhouse, Price, Waterhouse, Cooper, no, you going down. I love Price, Waterhouse, Cooper. They'll send your asses to hell and then prison. Fuck the city council and fuck the United States of America. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Madam hey, Chair, could I say something for a moment? Uh, just so, since we have so many people here that, excuse me, just because we have so many people here that haven't been to council meetings before, I just want to point out the city has lost some First Amendment lawsuits, so regardless of how vile and reprehensible things are that may be said, we have to allow for it. Uh, we certainly don't uh, necessarily support any of the things that you'll hear in public testimony. May I go, Madam Chair? You're speaking on an item? Yeah, I know what, uh, Matt. I'm in the permit rules and maintenance on public fucking works report for LAX Playa Field Oil. Now, I don't drive, but I sure fuck take trains. Ride on a metro, and I escape all this fucking rhetoric because I know what free speech can be robust. But unfortunately, Mr. Bonin, the Chango man, knows for a fact that 25 cents would save me lots of money on the back end, although I'm not a faggot. However, as liberal as I can be, knowing that money buys oil and oil pumps rigs in Santa Monica, I know what it's like to be HHH and measure H because a cunt can't give me a piece of that oil refinery pie. However, I don't drive 12 gallons a day. I minimize to drive under that. But according to the Department of Building and Safety, retaliatory niggas, they like to suppress me from driving. Oh, yeah, they're very racist, motherfuckers. Those Department of Building and Safety making it hard for me to live in Los Angeles, yo. Excuse me. You hear? Can you please stop the clock? We, we, Mr. Correz has already explained First Amendment rights. I understand what's being said is uncomfortable. Trust me, to be called the C-word on the mic is unpleasant. Um, so I'm going to ask the members of the public, please don't egg him on. Let him finish his two minutes so we can continue with our meeting. Go ahead. Look at that. Already being censored, already monitoring my motherfucking opinion the way the city corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse makes my livelihood and the quality of life of all my scholar skin so fucked up. Yeah. Think of all those people, veterans. Think of all those children and their families living in the fucking street before you suppress my fucking free speech. But come here every day and battle these three fucking cunts and a bitch, and you'll find out it's not easy. Time in, time out. Fighting for America and our free speech. 
Yes, it's venomous. Yes, it's robust. And it has an arena of fact. When you stimulate and stir these fucking bitches to listen. Otherwise, you got nothing to say but a little woof, 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 bark. So I know what it's like to be homeless. I know what it's like to see homeless people in a crisis when 1.2 billion fucking dollars and fucking oil that can't pump my truck up and down the fucking street and I can't regulate you. Fuck you. 42 U.S.C. 1983, God bless America, Trump. Go ahead, Corey. Okay, Corey Smith, for guys. the record. You've, so you filled out a card on every single item, correct? Yes. And your general public comment? you got three minutes, go. Okay, Corey Schmidt, for the record, I would like to say uh, good afternoon to all the bloodsuckers listening on this. Um, so I... Uh, First, I want to start off with First Amendment because we don't need to apologize for their behavior. It's their We're right. Speaking to speak. about the First Amendment, you are so, speaking on the items that you signed up for. Understand. And then you can get to your general public comment. Understandable. So you know what the rules so, are. Let's go ahead and do that. You're interrupting me. So, no, I'm not okay. interrupting you. I'm stating the facts. My, get on to the subjects. My time is ticking. Yes, um, it is. So uh, we're talking here about oil, and I want to illustrate the fact that oil around people generally causes cancer. Um, there is an oil well at Beverly Hills High School that has been subject to a lot of litigation and problems just because it's right next to kids that are learning. And um, we are considering, you know, if there's health impacts and getting inspections on oil um, and investigating about the storage, uh, pretty much storage yard, all those big containers over in El Segundo, um, right at Playa, uh, and I mean, I agree. I believe that the oil is dangerous, but we also have to consider the fact that we have an ocean of oil underneath our cities. And so I'm trying to think of, there's got to be some kind of way, because I know that we should be considering subterranean um, uh, construction in terms of our city. We got to deal with density and housing and all of that. And skyscrapers just sometimes aren't the answer so in order to get subterranean we're going to run into issues with these oil fields underneath us and I want to consider ways of getting rid of that oil somehow so that we can uh, build down there I don't want to face any restrictions there um, so that's what I have to say about the oil I'm not a fan of it um, I know that it causes problems, so I think that we should be limiting it and definitely don't want drilling out in the Santa Monica Bay. Um, you know, that sh I believe there's a sanctuary along our coast, and I don't want to see that removed. Um, so uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, the illegal dumping ordinance. Um, I uh, continue to speak on this 5G shit, and I just want to let you all know that that stuff can also make you illegally dump, make you shit when you don't want to, um, and I find that that to be illegal. Uh, I don't want to have to go to the bathroom when I don't want to go to the bathroom, so I think that we need to be putting some protections down and at least some meters, some sort of red tape that I can follow and personally go and do my investigation and say, okay, this is where the problem lies. Um, so that's all I have to say. Okay, that seems to conclude um, speaker, speakers on multiple items. Um, colleagues, except that Mike Greenspan and Antonio Ramirez don't seem to be in the room, so let's go ahead and um, note that for the record. Um, I know there's a number of speakers here on items one through three. Any, any speakers on items four and five? So I can move these. All right, so there is no speakers on items four and five. Colleagues, if there is... Um, Objection. I would like to move items four and five on consent. Okay, without objection, that will be the order. So before we move on to our oil discussion, make sure you wanted to get that out of the way. We have a number of speakers here this afternoon. I just want to make sure um, I, I just give you some guiding remarks in terms of what we expect from this meeting today. The discussion on urban oil drilling has been one that many folks have been waiting for a really long time. We have a 164-page report that I believe behooves us to make sure that everyone gets a complete overview of the report uh, in today's meeting before we prepare 
for a more in-depth conversation in future meetings. So I, I, this is a very complicated issue, um, colleagues, so it does require additional conversation in the future. I want to reinstate again that in today's meeting, we will not be taking action on item one on the Petroleum Administrative Report, but I do intend uh, to ask the CLA's office to assist in preparing a motion for introduction in council, requesting that the city attorney provide a legal analysis on elements of the report. So I just wanted to say that before we get started. I'm going to go ahead and call speakers up. If you hear your name, please come up to the table. Dr. Tom Williams, are you here? Dr. Tom Williams, I know there's two overflow rooms, so I want to give people an opportunity to make their way uh, to this room. So I'm going to keep going. Eric Roman, are you here? Yeah. You want to come on up, Eric? Is Dr. Tom Williams here? Has anybody seen him? Oh, there you are, Mr. Will Dr. Williams. Sorry about that. Uh, Paula Kahn? Paula? Kahn, are you here? Chris Cusack? Chris Cusack, are you here? Dan Kegel? No. I'm speaking on multiple items. Daryl Gale? Ethan Sensor? Ma'am, what is your name? Are you coming to speak? Daryl. You're Daryl? Daryl Gale? Okay. Ethan Sensor? Eugene Pesinkov? Anybody here with that name? Greg Barlett? Greg Barlett. Hi, what's your name? What is your name, sir? Dan Cagle. Dan Cagle, got it. Okay, why don't you go ahead and start us off, Dr. Williams. You have one minute to speak on items. No, sorry, you got... Can you bring up Dr. Williams, please, for me on the iPad? You're speaking on items two and three, and your general public comments. Yes. Is that and correct? Number one. Uh, do I have you down for, so you're speaking on all three items, and your general public comment? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for items, <laughs> public comments, and for the items one, two, three, but anyway. Okay. The basic elements for public comment is remove all conditions of O from all land use plans and zoning categories. Item O allows oil production to be done almost anywhere that an old oil field was. So remove all item conditions O in front of all zoning requirements. Also provide a specific zoning for oil production and gas production so that you have some means of regulating. For oil wells, easy one. 600 feet, okay, but as proven by practical application at Pico and Genesee, fully enclose all oil production up to 130 feet because we have it done now. SPR actually operates a fully enclosed general oil production platform at the corner of Pico and Genesee. Since they do it there, have them do it everywhere and have all the others do the same thing. That way, AQMD can also provide for emissions from a fixed source. There's an important issue there. Compliance. Elysio Canyon blowout was because they falsified records. They lied to Dogger, they lied to the county. They said that they had a valve down at the bottom of the well. No, they took it out in 1979. Have everything, all oil production, all gas production, verified by a competent petroleum engineer who knows what they're dealing with and can lose his license if he falsifies records. It needs to be done by the city attorney and fully enforced. For Playa del Rey, it's a mess. Ask the people in Montebello, ask the people in Porter Ranch as to, can you trust the gas company? I worked for the CPUC and 
year 2000, and there were problems in Playa del Rey. Then they had a blowout that ignited, and then they flared it, and they said, oh no, there's no problem. You got a problem when the person in charge says, well, it wasn't our fault, and has a flamed ignition of the flare and the blowout. So they lie, both. So that's all. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So I, I have at the table, I have Eric, who's next, then Daryl. Uh, are you Dan? Dan. Okay, so Dr. Williams, I'm going to have you go back and take a seat so I can ask uh, any of these folks. Did I call your name? What's your Come on up, Paula. This is for items two and three. I understand that, but you're not next. I'm going to go to Eric, then I'm going to go to Daryl, Dan, and then you. Go ahead, Eric. You're speaking on items one through three. Yeah. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Eric Roman with the Stand LA Coalition. Uh, Stand, our, our broad coalition, brought hundreds of folks out here today, um, many of whom are in this room, and uh, dozens, possibly hundreds, are in overflow rooms. Um, working class folks, uh, students who took time out of their day, out of their work schedule, out of their school, to be here to share their experiences. Many of them will not be able to uh, stay till the end of the meeting and may not get a chance to speak as want to acknowledge that up front. Um, we hope that as many as possible do. I name that because these communities, the, these folks have come out today because for decades, frankly, the city has failed them, um, failed to protect their health from toxic uh, oil drilling near their homes and near their schools. Um, we are happy, although we are frustrated, um, that we are at this point. That it took us a while to get here, but we're glad to finally be here to advance this conversation um, uh, about a sensible policy to phase out oil drilling uh, in neighborhoods. And the science very clearly shows that 2,500 feet um, is a safe distance. Anything less than that is not a safe distance and, and uh, exposes our families and children uh, to toxic harm. And with regard to the inspections motion that's uh, on the agenda today, the reality is that while uh, increasing safety has uh, uh, at oil drilling sites is not a bad thing. It is also true that the, the regulatory framework uh, to approaching uh, oil wells in neighborhoods has failed us for decades, right? That's why we're here today to call, to ask for it to be phased out because inspecting and regulating have simply not worked. Um, many people here uh, today can attest to that much better than I can. Um, so I want to point that out for the record. We support Councilmember Bonham's motion to uh, investigate uh, the potential uh, health and safety risks associated with the Playa del Rey SoCal gas facility. Um, we are aware that uh, although gas storage facilities are certainly not the same as oil drilling, um, some of the chemicals in use are the same, uh, the potential harms uh, and risks to communities are the same. Um, and overall, we want to encourage this council to aggressively move forward to take all measures uh, at its disposal um, to protect our communities from dangerous oil and gas. And we want to make sure in the process um, that all impacted parties um, are, that the concerns and needs of all impacted parties, including workers at, uh, at oil and gas facilities, are taken care of. Um, so we encourage the council also uh, to, in parallel, explore uh, development of a workforce development plan uh, for impacted workers and also um, to repair harm and redevelop uh, impacted communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daryl, you're speaking. Go ahead, Eric. Go ahead and take a seat so I can call somebody else up. Daryl. Sir with the blue shirt, what is your name? Ethan Spencer. Ethan Spencer. Come on and take a seat. Daryl is kidding. Daryl, you're speaking on items one and three. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I'm thank you for your patience. Them. Go ahead. Okay, I'm combining one and three. Uh -huh. I am here to support Councilman Bonin's um, uh, uh, request. Um, I'm here to ask for you to investigate the SoCal Gas Playa del Rey facility before we have another earthquake or incipient sea level rise or another tsunami or typhoon from Japan, but most of all, before we have another fire. It is really not fair that citizens bear the brunt of the risks for oil and gas drilling and for the storage of these facilities under or adjacent to their schools and residents. We must have a 2,500 foot 
buffer. Yes, I know it's going to be hard, but we have to work towards a 2,500 foot buffer, and we need active promotion and policies of 100 percent clean energy. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Dan. You're speaking on items one and three. Hold on for just a second. Then followed by Paula and Ethan. Did I call your name, sir? Yes. What is your name? Eugene. Come on. Come on. Go ahead and sit, take that seat. Go ahead, Dan. Hi. Uh, my name is Dan Kegel. I live in West Adams in, within walking distance of an oil field. Um, I'm annoyed by its noise. I'm worried about its emissions. And I'm worried about our future. I think that it's really important to proceed along two paths. One, increasing regulation and inspection uh, and fund that uh, with a barrel tax. Um, and two, um, we need to increase a setback to improve safety. Uh, so I support both of these motions and uh, I urge you to not be scared by the fossil fuel industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sir, hold on for Paula. Did you, did I call your name, sir? Yes. Chris? Craig. Craig. Yes, I did call you. Come on up. And Paula, you're speaking on items one, two, and three. Is that right? <clears throat> Correct. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Paula Khan. I am a digital organizer for SoCal 350, and I live in Reseda, which isn't too far from the LISO uh, gas storage facility. I'm here today as a member of the Stand LA Coalition and acting in solidarity with frontline communities from here in Los Angeles throughout Latin America. Um, as you all know, LA is a global city, which means it's an epicenter to the global economy. So the decisions we make here in LA are a model for other cities around the world, as well as for California as a state. We live in a state that's one of the largest economies in the world. So again, when we're in a city that's a global city, in a state that has one of the largest economies in the world, the decisions we make here matter. I work with um, environmental defenders in Latin America that have to flee because of uh, narco governments and mega projects that uh, destabilize indigenous communities in Latin America. And something that I've learned from the folks that I work with that defend the earth in Latin America is that what the decisions we make here in Los Angeles set a precedent for policy in Latin America as well. So when we take care of our frontline communities here in Los Angeles and we phase out, we roll out a 2,500 foot safety and health buffer zone, we set an example for what, what is an, what is the standard around the planet. So I think we need to set an example to other places in the world and protect frontline communities here at home so that we set an example for earth defenders in other parts of the world. Um, I think it's really important that we consider workers when we, uh, uh, when we initiate a just transition by rolling out a 2,500 uh, setback between frontline communities and oil drilling sites. We need to engage workers in uh, the transition itself and engage them in, in the cleanup, in um, monitoring the damage that's been done from oil drilling sites, and also training folks in other uh, in other uh, in other skill sets such as uh, tree planting and land regeneration and uh, cleanups of uh, spills. Um, uh, I'd like to support uh, Council Member Bonin's motion to investigate health risks, risks associated with the Playa del Rey facility. Um, and I think uh, item number two is important because we really need more accountability. I am familiar that uh, the oil well report uh, was late this past year. It's been late. And so I think um, item number two would set a precedent to ensure that uh, those reports aren't late in the future. Um, yep. And that's all for now. All right. Thank you very much. Ethan? Yes, Ethan, okay. followed by Eugene, followed by Greg. Uh, Ethan, you're speaking on items one and three. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ethan Sensor. I'm an organizer with Food and Water Action. Um, I'm here in support of Councilman Lebanon's motion to investigate operations at Playa del Rey and to stand in solidarity with Stand LA in the call for a 2,500 foot buffer zone. Um, these are both matters of public health. Uh, they're a matter of public health just in the day to day operations of these facilities. Uh, fumes, toxins, leaks that frontline communities are told that they need to uh, sacrifice themselves for uh, as cost of doing business. Um, we refuse to buy into the false choice between our health, our communities, our environment, and doing what's right for workers. Um, 
And this is a matter of public safety when disaster strikes. This is, um, we're coming up on the anniversary of Aliso Canyon, part of which is currently still on fire. Um, and similar events at Playa del Rey, for example, could displace over 500,000 people while shutting down LAX. Um, the communities around uh, Playa del Rey are not what they once were 50 to 60 years ago, and we need to investigate the permitting of the site and see if it's really in compliance. But at the heart for both of these issues, both Playa del Rey and oil drilling, um, these are community issues, which means that we need to be approaching them with community-wide solutions, because the struggles of labor, of environmental justice, of socioeconomic justice, of providing real careers for our community's future, these are all one and the same. And as climate change gets more severe, all of these struggles will become more intense. So in addition to moving forward with the Playa del Rey motion and supporting STAND, I'm also calling, uh, like Eric mentioned, on supporting the development of a workplace, workplace development and just transition plan in partnership with workers and unions. This needs to be central to everything that we're talking about here, that we start treating these problems as problems to our communities with community-wide solutions. And you can help us make that happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eugene. Uh, you're speaking on uh, general public comment in item number three. That's right. Uh, my name is Eugene. I'm an organizer with DSALA and Extinction Rebellion LA. And I also uh, am in favor of Mike Bonin's uh, motion. Uh, the last time, or the permit, as I was made aware, was issued in 1955. And I think, you know, it's more than reasonable to have that facility uh, looked into again. And, you know, I was, I was born in Belarus, uh, 80 miles from Chernobyl. And, you know, I know what can happen if there is a natural disaster that can displace an entire city. And I think that the city, or all of y'all on the city council, would best be served to um, do the right thing. You know, a lot of us here, um, talk about climate change and doing something about it, then here's an opportunity to, as Paula mentioned, lead the way on, in that effort to take initiative and actually, you know, uh, create a society in which our children and, you know, uh, future generations can uh, all live in. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that this is a no-brainer and you know to the labor uh, movement you know I think it's vital as Nathan said to uh, make sure that we transition as many workers as possible and, and create unions and create a transition where they don't feel abandoned and I think that this movement seeks to do exactly that and I think again everyone on City Council who claims to uh, believe in climate change and want, wants to do something about it here is the opportunity to do exactly that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, uh, Greg, before you speak, I'm going to call a couple more speakers. I called uh, Chris Cusack earlier today. Is he here? Is Chris here? If not, I'm going to go ahead and remove him from the queue. I'm going to call Ron Miller up, Stuart Wallman, Martha Arguello, and Michelle Pritchard. Are you guys all here? Uh, I mean, one, one uh, chair short. So when we have Stuart come up, Martha, are you ready? And we're just going to hold on Michelle. And Greg, you're speaking on items one and three. Is that right? Correct. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Why don't you go ahead and start? My name is Greg Bartlett. Uh, I'm a community member. I live in West LA, right between the Culver City oil fields and uh, Playa del Rey uh, gas um, storage facility. Um, I'm an ally to Stand LA and to Food and Water Action, and a friend to people who are suffering from the uh, uh, oil wells being too close to their homes. Um, I want to second uh, Council, uh, Councilman Bonin's assertion that we have to be careful about putting a dollar value on individual lives. In addition, we have to be careful about putting a dollar value on uh, the, the potential cost of a disaster such as Aliso Canyon happening in, uh, in our community. Um, I, don't, I don't know the science as well, and I'm, and I'm not going to waste, waste your time reading other people's words. Um, a 2,500 dollar, 2,500, 2,500 foot setback is a minimum we can do. These wells were built before the um, the communities. Uh, we've built the communities. We need to protect the communities. Uh, the savings of lives and the savings of money from healthcare uh, costs and, and such are are worthwhile. 
Um, I also uh, support the Green New Deal. I support this in a, in a New Deal sense where we're not just closing these wells. We're working with the people who, uh, the workers um, who support these wells and either moving their, their uh, skills elsewhere or retraining. Uh, this should all be part of the deal. Um, as far as uh, the uh, storage facility in, um, in Playa del Rey, this is even perhaps a greater issue that uh, it's not just individual lives we're dealing with. We're dealing with shutting down the potential to shut down an entire city. And, uh, you know, we, all, all of the things that we deal with every day, traffic, these are all costs that need to be taken into account. We can't undervalue the lives that we're saving. Thank you, Greg. Um, Ms. Thank you. Can you um, then, Ms. Shaw can go ahead and sit in your seat. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with Martha? You've, you only, you're only speaking on one item, item one? Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Marta Dinarwe. I'm the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility and also the co-chair of Standing Together Against Neighborhood Drilling. You know, before I came to work at PSR, I spent most of my career working in public health, from working with asthma, around asthma issues, working around the efforts to ban smoking, uh, and working with uh, women who were experiencing breast cancer. That work taught me that prevention is worth an ounce of cure. And what we're asking you today is to begin to take preventive action much of which is not supported by our current regulatory structure, and we have to be bold to be able to meet the challenge that climate, the crisis pl places. It's an emergency. Uh, it's time that Los Angeles does the right thing and moves beyond oil. But part of doing the right thing is also making sure that we put communities and workers first, that we find ways to support workers during this transition, including a trust fund that's paid for by the oil industry who has made profit off their backs for many years. Uh, and it's time that we stop using a dead body and a smoking gun standard to be able to act to Thank protect you, public health. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, next speaker is Stuart Wallman, followed by Ron Miller and Michelle Pritchard. Go ahead, Stuart. Good afternoon, Stuart Wallman, President of VICA. <clears throat> While we commend the time and effort put into conducting and completing the oil and gas setback report, we are here to oppose the recommendations on increased setback distances for local oil and gas production. The proposed recommendations would negatively impact our local economy and jeopardize good-paying, middle-class jobs for thousands of residents in the Valley and throughout Los Angeles. They would also impose excessive costs on Los Angeles' residents and businesses. Implementing the recommended setbacks could cost upwards of $90 billion. This number doesn't even take into account the loss of economic productivity in our communities caused by the elimination of thousands of local jobs. Shutting down oil and gas production will make us even more dependent on foreign oil and imports. More than 70% of oil used in Los Angeles is currently imported from other sources, mainly foreign countries, and this percentage will drastically increase with an expanded setback distance. If we don't produce energy locally, we are forced to import more of it from other countries. Thank you, Stuart. Next speaker is Ron. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. I'd like all the building trades folks in the room to please stand up. We have some uh, tree planters here today from the building trades. We have some plumbers, some boilermakers, iron workers, pipe fitters. We do a lot of the work in the refineries. We do a lot of work uh, that everybody's talking about in the new green jobs. So on your uh, table there, you have an economic impact report that shows that the oil and gas industry spending, they spend billions of dollars in the state of California, $30 billion in the last 10 years, uh, powering tens of thousands of construction jobs. $30 billion just on construction in the last 10 years. That $30 billion represents 130 million construction labor hours from almost 200 major oil and gas projects. The 100 million construction labor hours is equivalent to five times as many hours used to build the Golden One Center in Sacramento, the Chase Center, the Los Angeles Stadium at Hollywood, the Bank of California Stadium, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and the Wilshire Grand Hotel. This means a lot to us. It has a big economic effect in the whole state. Two and a half billion dollars over those last 10 years in, this, in the city of Los Angeles. So please take this into account when you uh, do your deliberations on this report over the next week 
two weeks, months, years, however long it takes to get through this and make the right decisions for the economy and working people of Los Angeles. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Michelle, before I call, uh, before you speak, let me go ahead and call a couple of more speakers. Amy Coyd, are you here? Amy Coyd? Amy Coyd, Jack Edit, Jeanette Ronsberg, Jeanette Ronsberg, Jesse Milkman, Jesse Milkman, John Karen. If I called your name, can you please come up? Ma'am, what's your name? Jeanette. Jeanette? Okay, Jeanette. Any Vonsberg, yeah, I've got you down. Anyone else that I've called? Are you in the room? If you're in the overflow room, can you please make your way to room 1010? If you're exiting or hearing, I just ask you to please do it as quietly as possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm going to give some folks just enough time. Maybe they're in the overflow room, but why don't you go ahead and get started? You're speaking sure. on item number one. Yes, thank go you. Go ahead. So I am Michelle Pritchard with the Liberty Hill Foundation, and I just wanted to say that ending neighborhood drilling is truly an environmental justice issue in Los Angeles. Uh, at the Liberty Hill Foundation, we have funded environmental justice education and organizing since the 1980s. Most of you here know that, and it's one of the most critical issues that we work upon. In 2013, Esperanza Community Housing called our office about the terrible health impacts that residents were experiencing in their affordable housing complex right across the street from the Allen Co. oil drilling site. And then we heard from others in South LA and in the harbor. Thanks to those community stories, in 2015 we published this report called Drilling Down, the Community Consequences of Oil Drilling. And it demonstrates that these sites are overwhelmingly located in low-income communities that suffer from heavy industry, freeway pollution, and more. Our goal was for this report to be a call to action for our city leaders. It is now four years later. Stand LA. So, time for All action. Right, Thank up. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Jeanette, before you get started, um, let me, what are your names? Uh, Jesse Olson Milkman. Jesse Milkman, and uh, what is your name? John Karen. Hold on for just a sec. John Karen. Okay, I got you both on here. And your name? Jack Ike. Jack, okay. So why don't you go ahead and um, get started, Jeanette, and you're speaking on item two and three. Okay, on uh, item two, I'd just like to point out that I've been around the Playa del Rey oil field for about 22 years, up close and personal. And I think a 25-foot, 2,500-foot buffer zone is ideal. Sure better than what we have with people living right on top of oil wells and beside them. On item two, I'd like to support both Carrets and Bonin for their foresight in calling for a study or investigation of the Playa del Rey uh, SoCal gas oil field. I, again, have been around to see what they've done and actually been part of a lawsuit against them, which Grassroots Coalition won. And there's no doubt in my mind, looking back over many records, that they lie, and they lie, and they lie. People's health do, do not, that just doesn't count in their book. They take chances constantly. Porter Ranch is a perfect example, but, you know, a wall of fire has gone up against the Playa del Rey Bluff before. They were shut down for over a year. And I think today is the ideal time to make a decision to close down SoCal Gas and to do everything to study and make sure that they're doing everything right. They have a conditional use permit that they've been violating pretty much since they took over the field when they boosted the gas from 700 pounds per inch. And think about that. That's 20 times what your tires have and the air gets out. And they boosted it to up to 2,500 pounds per inch. 
and that's very significant, and we're talking deadly gases. Thank you, Jeanette. Next speaker, go ahead. Um, you, Jess? All right. uh, you're speaking on items three and general public comment? Yes. My name is Jesse Olson Milkman, and I'm an organizer with Ground Game Los Angeles, and I'm here to support Mike Bonin's uh, proposed investigation, item three. I've worked extensively in the Northwest Valley, the area most affected by the Elisa blowout. I've spoken with and worked alongside people affected by the blowout who were forced to relocate and got sick because of it. We cannot allow another blowout like that. Playa is so much more centrally located than Aliso, and we have seen in recent times that it is itself leaking and unsafe. A blog there would affect many more people than Aliso and be much more disastrous. We also recently saw the report on what caused the Aliso facility blowout, the dilapidated uh, equipment and the corroded pipes. The most pro problematic thing about the report, though, is that it was a post-mortem. What went wrong rather than what we can prevent? We can al not allow such a mistake on Playa. This investigation is a vital step to seeing just how dangerous this facility is. We need to stop all oil extracting and have a just transition to renewable energy sooner rather than later. This isn't a fight between workers and the community. We all deserve clean air and good jobs. Extraction doesn't just destroy the climate and poison our community. It poisons the workers at those facilities. And so a just transition is one in partnership with and supporting the workers affected by the necessary and inevitable end to extraction. Uh, this investigation is a good first step along those way, those okay. lines. Thank you. John, hold on. Let me just bring up your items. John, you're speaking on items one and three. And before you do that, go ahead, Jesse, and go ahead and, and let me call a couple of more speakers so they can come up. Hold on for just a second, John. Rebecca Lieb, are you here? Rebecca Lieb, Sherry Lear, and Veronica Wilson. So let's give them time for them to come. Maybe they're in a different room. Go ahead, John. You're speaking on items one and items number, th item one and three. Hi, uh, my name is John Karen. Uh, I'm a member of Sunrise Movement Los Angeles. I'm here to support the 2,500 foot setback from oil and gas operations in the city. Uh, we're in a climate crisis currently, uh, but we also have an immediate health crisis. Um, these are frontline communities that are already being sickened uh, and killed by fossil fuel extraction. Um, I recently visited some of these drilling sites uh, and I started feeling sick within five minutes of being around them. Um, and these sites were literally across the street from homes, from schools, hospitals, uh, businesses, uh, children's parks. Um, and if we take the language of a Green New Deal for our city seriously, uh, then they need to be shut down immediately. Um, and this also means that we must have a just transition for workers that may lose jobs or be impacted by the closure of these sites. Uh, we need a good workforce development plan, which brings workers and communities to the table to ensure justice for all. We need a real Green New Deal, and ending this environmental injustice and environmental racism uh, is an immediate first step that we have to take. Um, we can't be held hostage by so-called mineral rights uh, to extract oil, uh, which just means the right to sicken and kill us for profit. Um, in regard to uh, Mr. Bonin's proposal, um, I'm in support of investigating SoCal gas around the Playa del Rey storage facility and ultimately having it shut down. Uh, it has a history of leaks, it's close to communities and to LAX, and it's simply unnecessary and unsafe. Um, the hills of Aliso Canyon are charred black right now. Um, 100,000 people had to evacuate during the fires um, and had to wonder whether there would be a catastrophic explosion or another blowout. Um, I've heard from community members there right now who are experiencing trauma um, because they're reminded of what happened four years ago and are scared. Uh, studies show that Playa del Rey is at really high risk from fire, from floods, from earthquakes, and it only holds a tiny amount of gas that the state uses, um, but it poses an enormous danger, so it needs to be investigated and shut down immediately. Okay, um, what are your names, the two women that just joined us? My name is Rebecca Lee. Hey, Rebecca Lieb, and your name? My name is Amy Coit. Amy, I called you a while back. Okay. Uh, is Sherry Lear here? Or Veronica Wilson? Okay, you want to come on up? Are you, are you Sherry or are you Veronica? Veronica. Okay. Are you Sherry? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jack. And you're speaking on items two and three. Yeah, I think I meant one and three. But, uh, one and three, okay. Basically, I wanted to support a 2,500-foot setback. Uh, and, and I think 2,500-foot 
is a minimum of health set setback because uh, I'm an urban planner. I work, uh, you know, our goal is to create healthy uh, communities that work, um, you know, and, and having people be safe in their homes, um, opening up the door. I live in Echo Park, historic Filipino town area. There's drilling not far from where I'm at. When I walk through, I often walk through the morning near those drilling sites and they smell, okay? And, and when we open our doors and there's a scent of something that's happening out there, that's, that's, that's a significant thing that, uh, you know, people can't be safe just living in their homes. So we need to create a uh, distance between us and oil, and, and I think a 2,500-foot setback helps us do that. We also, it's imperative to institute a, a managed decline of fossil fuels as we understand that climate change is happening. Uh, and, and the state as well as the city are working on demand, the demand side, but the supply side, as, as, as we keep putting oil into the system, um, you know, we're not going to get ahead of that. And, and also I would say that it's not a significant portion of what's being burned right now. So uh, we, we need to start somewhere with stopping the flow of oil. Um, I also want to support uh, uh, Kretz and Bonin's motion with the, the gas field because I think also it's an important thing to look at. And thank you for hearing me out. And I'm from SoCal 350 if I didn't thank say that. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, you're speaking on items uh, three in general public comment and then Amy, followed by Amy and uh, Sherry. No, Veronica. you're Veronica and you're Sherry. Sure. Sherry, why don't you go ahead and take a seat? Is it possible for me to cede my time to someone who has to leave? Beatriz Carrillo? Uh, I don't ha I'm just going based on how your names are popping up, so I need to, I need to take you up first or else everyone else gets. Right. Thank you. So thank you for your patience. Um, Rebecca, you're speaking on items three and general public comment. Go ahead. Okay, general public comment first. Um, I'm with Sunrise Movement and um, I'm standing together against neighborhood drilling today. Um, and general public comment, it's very, very simple. Um, there are oil wells that are in cer at certain parts of town, and then there are no oil wells on the west side. And if we're being blunt, it's just racism, and there's nothing more to say. Like, we just have to really try to embody the society that we want to have. It's just racism. Um, so I'm going to talk more about... Um, you know, how grateful I am that um, Mike Bonner has introduced a proposal to investigate the permit um, that SoCal Gas is using for the Playa del Rey gas storage facility. Um, I spent six months of my life canvassing for 10 hours a day in support of Lorraine Lundquist with Food and Water Action. Um, I was canvassing around Aliso Canyon. I definitely got sick from it. I felt very ill and didn't really know what was going on, but I fell asleep at 8 p.m. And I woke up at 2 p.m. the next day, went to the doctor, they ran a bunch of tests. I didn't have a bacterial infection, I didn't have a virus. I got sick just from that six month period of exposure. It's not a safe facility. And this sort of thing is so preventable. It's so preventable. We've known that both of these facilities are at earthquake risk. Aliso, we've been saying for years, is a wildfire risk. <coughs> Just need to take it seriously. Like, I, on Thursday night, like, before I went to bed, I checked Twitter, and I saw that there was a fire, and my first thought was, oh my god, I have friends who live in Chatsworth, and Porter Ranch, and Granada Hills, and they're going to fall asleep, and they're going to be burned alive. And, like, no one wants to worry about that, and no one wants to worry about that with the Playa del Rey gas storage facility as well. Like, you don't want to just worry that your friends are going to die of benzene exposure, that their dogs are going to pass away in their backyards. It's not something that we have to worry about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Ver Veronica Wilson, followed by Amy, followed by Sherry. Veronica, you're speaking on items one and three. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Veronica Wilson. Um, I'm here with the Labor Network for Sustainability, and our tagline is making a living on a living planet. Um, because we know that jobs versus the environment frame only serves the bosses and the polluters, no workers, uh, rather not workers, and the communities. Um, I, along with the um, Labor Network for Sustainability, believe that progress on environmental policies like the one you're discussing today are consistent with an agenda for unions and working families. 
In fact, the agenda that ties economic and environmental justice together is our best hope for creating a just and sustainable future here in Los Angeles. Um, I can tell you about meetings that I convened with some of the people who are here representing our um, labor community. But we should be thinking about the labor and community partnerships the and the environmental justice community and labor partnerships, just to be specific, um, so that we can have some political breakthroughs. I am here in favor of the 2,500 foot uh, setback. And then very briefly, uh, I'd like to mention that I grew up in Playa del Rey. <coughs> <clears throat> and uh, I just think you should shut the gas facility down. So I do appreciate the work that's being done on that, but um, I kind of think we know. So uh, whatever studies that you can do as quickly as possible would be great, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Veronica. Amy, you're speaking in item number one. You have a special guest with you. What is your name? You don't want to say your name in the mic? Okay. This is my daughter, Liana. I am a resident of South LA, and I live, um, in my daily life, I interact with about three drill sites. One on Jefferson um, Avenue, one on, um, the one on Adams, and um, where I work at Mount St. Mary's University, um, I'm right next to, it's adjacent to the Ellen Co. drill site. And I was very concerned um, in, at the end of September when I got an email saying that some leaks had been detected there and that we had to report any kind of um, nausea or dizziness or any other symptoms to um, the health department or, or some authority. Um, and I'm especially concerned because my son, um, my two-year-old, goes to daycare that's at Mount St. Mary's University. So um, when I read the entire um, circular that I got, I was very concerned to hear that residents have been reporting all these different health symptoms. So I am uh, in support of anything that would um, have a protective measure towards residents in that area. All right, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Sherry, before you start, let me call a couple more speakers up. Uh, uh, Adolf Navarro? Adolf, are you here? Adolf Navarro? Albert Hernandez? Albert? Albert, is that you? Yes. You're Albert? Yes. Come on up. Adolf Navarro's not here? How about Alfredo Leiva? Alfredo Leiva, are you here? Elise Duffel? Druffel, I'm sorry. Elise Druffel? Maybe they're in the other room. So why don't you go ahead, Sherry, you're speaking on items two and three. Uh, I also, I actually met item one. I hit the wrong button, but one and three. So one and three. Yes, okay. thank you. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon and thank you. My name is Sherry Lear. I'm a resident of San Pedro. I'm a single mom. I am also a business owner in Torrance. So um, I live in the shadows of the Phillips 66 refinery and I work in the shadows of the Torrance refinery. And in between, I go by a lot of urban oil drilling every single day. I'm here on behalf of myself and also 350 South Bay Los Angeles, which is the oldest 350 chapter in California. We have memberships for uh, from El Segundo all the way down into the Los Angeles Harbor. And so we, we support our EJ allies and our EJ community and frontline communities. Would like to support um, uh, Mr. Bonin's um, motion to have a study regarding the Playa del Rey facility. And we are also an ally with Stand LA. We support 2,500 foot setbacks for oil drilling away from schools, homes, and other sensitive sites. And I'll just tell you a little joke before I go. What does um, Dallas have that LA doesn't? What two things? Steers and setbacks. Dallas has 1,500 foot setbacks. We have no setbacks in Los Angeles. This is a health and safety issue. Um, we need to better protect the people who live next to these facilities. If you come down to Wilmington, you will see that these are literally next to people's backyards. They are in the parking lot at the Carson Target. Um, they are in parking lots of churches, these, these oil drilling facilities. There are zero setbacks. 600 feet is not enough. 2,500 is what science recommends, and 350.org gets our name from science because we want to bring our atmospheric carbon dioxide back down to under to 350 degrees or less, and right now we're over 400. So thank you. Thank you very much. Albert Adolf, hey. Adolf Navarro. Adolf Navarro. 
Uh, and your name, ma'am? What's your name? Alice Druffle. Alice? Yes. Uh, Druffle. Is Alfredo Leva here? Alfredo Leva? How about Alonso Hill? Yes. You want to come on up, Alonso? Mr. Albert Hernandez? That's Go ahead. You're speaking on item number one, sir. Pardon? Item number one. You're number one? No, you're speaking on... Oh, item four, the setback. Yeah. Item number one. You want to start? I don't, well, that's about the setback, isn't it? Right. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what you're speaking right, on. Well, that's, that's what I was Go ahead. comment on. I, uh, uh, I'm 87 years old. I was born in Torrance. Just a, a few hundred feet from that refinery, which used to be General Petroleum. And uh, after World War II, uh, uh, people came in like tidal waves from all over the world. And uh, we used to have talk about uh, buffer zones around the harbor, around the refineries, the <laughs> steel mill, the airport, and everything. We had all kinds of setbacks. And people start moving in on their own right next to all this heavy industry. And, uh, and now they want to complain. And uh, so I'm kind of puzzled about that. They knew what they were doing. The airport, I mean, uh, I've heard people complain about that all the time. The refinery, the same thing. I worked in the refinery 13 years. I made an excellent living work, uh, uh, working in that refinery. Uh, I've raised a good-sized family. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there's a lot of other people that made a good living out of that business. And the harbor the same way. And uh, now you can't hardly find a, 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 a lot to build a house around all these industries. And people want to complain about it. Thank but, you, Albert. You know, it's time to think, well, we brought it on ourselves. Yeah. You know, everybody moved here from all over the country. Like I said, when I was a kid, there was acres all over the doggone place empty. Okay, your time and is now up. now you don't find a, a lot. So, All right. Thank you very much for being of, here. Yeah. We got it. Thank you, sir, for being here. You're, you're, thank you very much for being here. And by the way, you look amazing for 87 years old. Pardon? You look amazing for being 87 years old. Well, I'm a construction. You got to give me the secret. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get that secret from you. You look great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you, Albert. Um, uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, Adolf, followed by Elise and Alonzo Hill. Go ahead. Thank you, Councilman. And you're uh, speaking on items number one. Okay. My name is Adolf Navarro, and I'm a proud member of Plumbers Local 761. If you shut, uh, and we oppose the setback. Uh, if you shut down, where will all my workers go? Uh, keep the money here, keep the people employed, and keep tax revenue local. Thank you. Thank you. Elise? Good afternoon. My name is Alice Druffel, and I am with California Interfaith Power and Light and the Watts Clean Air and Energy Committee. Uh, Interfaith Power and Light is a proud partner of Stand LA and has about 100 member congregations comprising about 40,000 people of faith. We're in strong support of a 2,500 foot health and safety barrier and job training and placement for impacted workers. It's crucial that we protect our neighbors, especially those who live near sources of oil and gas extraction. My own sister who lived in, in Torrance and whose housing tract was built on top of old oil fields that they did not know of, uh, died of breast cancer last year and there is a cancer cluster in her neighborhood. So uh, Los Angeles is committed to the clean energy transition while addressing the multiple social injustices of environmental racism, poverty, and high unemployment. So establishing a 2,500 foot barrier will be a working solution for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alice. I'm gonna call a couple of more speakers. Um, thank you, Alice and Adolf. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Before, we, before you um, speak, Alonso, I'm gonna call a couple of more speakers. I called Alfredo Leva few times, it doesn't seem like he's here. Uh, Reverend Clarence Moore, okay, you wanna um, pop him to the table? And I'm gonna have you speak right after um, Mr. Hill. Amalia Sanchez, are you here? Uh, por favor, pásale aquí a la mesa. Amanda Jimenez? Amanda Jimenez, are you here? Oh, she has four. 
Okay, Amanda. How about Amanda Pantoja? Amanda Jimenez and Amanda Pantoja. Go ahead, Mr. Hill. You're speaking on one item, item number one. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Alonzo Hill, and I'm energy professional. And I just want to uh, to ask you to look at in terms of the policy that you're 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 about to undertake. Uh, I uh, live near oil field. My wife. I have two daughters and, and and a wife, and and we are a highly regulated industry, and we provide a safe product, uh, and ener which is energy, which is uh, fuels our economy. Um, this year, uh, I had a heart to uh, donate my time with the uh, firm that, uh, that backed me to, I work on Skid Row. And so I see, I work every day with individuals that are homeless or experiencing homelessness. And as you are looking at this policy, you have to look at the economics. And we have a number of individuals that are at that at that at that uh, point where they could slip into homelessness and and we want to make sure that we provide economic opportunity for these individuals thank you mr. thank Hill. you very much um, young lady that you just you just what is your name hi my name is Amanda Jimenez I'm sorry I can't hear with the clapping what is your name again yes you Amanda Jimenez Amanda Jimenez okay Amanda Pantoja is that person here are you Amanda Pantoja come on up Amalia it's me. It's you? Okay, so why don't we go ahead and hear from Reverend Moore. Uh, uh, you are speaking uh, general public comment. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm Reverend Clarence Moore. I'm president of the Los Angeles Ministers Pastors uh, Forum. Um, we, I represent um, about 100 churches in the South Central area, South Central LA area. We are very concerned about the safety and about how this 2,500 setback would affect jobs. Um, we had so many homeless in Los Angeles. This would have a direct effect on the economic uh, stability that that we have. Uh, so people losing their jobs. Um, this is a very concern. The churches, uh, we've talked about it, and so we ask you to reject this recommendation. Do not do this recommendation, simply because it's going to have such a great effect on all the people. And people in our congregation are already on fixed incomes, or those that are working, they don't want to lose their jobs. So. I appeal to you to not uh, go with this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you for being here. Amalia Sanchez, ¿necesita traductor? Sí. Un momentito. Uh -huh. uh, va, va a hablar sobre el artículo 1 y la traductora le va a traducir. Ok. Nomás le, le aviso que por favor este, deje para que ella le dé más tiempo para traducir. Está bien. I was just instructing her to give her some time for the translator to go ahead and translate. Go ahead. Mi nombre es Amalia Sánchez, vengo de la ciudad de Wilmington. My name is Amalia Sánchez and I'm coming from Wilmington. Me dieron muchos papeles para hablar, pero tengo bien claro lo que voy a hablar porque soy residente y para mí es... I'm a lot of, uh, I have a lot of notes about what I'm going to say, but I, I think I don't need them. I, I, I know exactly what I want to say. Yo vengo a, a, a pedir que se haga conciencia de lo... De, Los pozos que están tan cerca de nuestras casas, de nuestra iglesia, de mi hogar. I am concerned about all the different uh, oil drilling very close to our uh, homes and schools. Donde voy a llevar a mi hijo a la, a la iglesia, donde voy a, a llevar a mi hijo a comprar una burguesa, ahí están los, los sub y bajas como dicen mis nietos. They are everywhere. When I take my kids to, um, to, to buy something in a neighborhood. Do, 2,500 para mí todavía se me hace bien poco. Yo pidiera hasta 3,000. Yo sé que hay muchas enfermedades. Yo no vengo a pedir que quiten trabajos, pero busquemos alternativas para seguir teniendo unos lugares limpios. I think, well, when I take my, previously you said when I take my son to uh, buy hamburgers and everywhere. But um, I think that $2,500 setback is not enough. I would ask for $3,000 uh, setback. But I think that we, um, I don't want anyone to lose their job, but I think that we should find an alternative solution. This is not acceptable. Mi nieto de 12 años me hizo tener conciencia. Dijo, no más turques que te da la refinería. No más que te paguen por ir a hablar que hagan pozos petroleros. ¿Qué me estás dejando para que yo viva? My 12 year old told me, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't accept the turkeys that the refineries give, give away. 
because they give you turkeys so they can come and support them and they have more refineries. He said, no more turkeys, Grandma. Perdón, perdón, porque a veces estamos desesperados en lo que vivemos. Estamos muy desesperados. Yo les pido que tomen conciencia todos los días, oro por cada uno de ustedes, que Dios les dio la oportunidad de tener este puesto. De verdad, gracias. Y estoy yendo a la escuela para aprender inglés para que la intérprete no me gane el tiempo. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think we're very passionate, we're very, we're desperate, and uh, and, and uh, I think that I think of you every day, and I pray to God because you have the power to do something, and you have been blessed because you have this, uh, the, uh, you you're in a position where you can make a change, and I'm going to school so that the interpreter doesn't take my time. <laughs> Okay, hold on for just a second. We have two Amandas. Uh, before you, before you speak, Amanda Jimenez, you're going first. Let me just call a couple of more speakers. There's another Amanda, Amanda DeRosa, Amanda Parson DeRosa. Are you here? Okay, Amanda. Uh, you, oh, she's in the other room. Okay, so let's give her some time. How about Anna Parks? Come on up. Okay, so Amanda Jimenez, and then followed by Amanda Pantoja. Hi, you're speaking on item number one. Yes. Hello, my name is Amanda Jimenez, and I am representing the Department of Preventative Medicine at USC. We have reviewed the analysis and recommendation of the city's recently released report on oil and draw attention to the existing evidence that demonstrates health impacts associated with upstream petroleum extraction among residents living half mile to three miles from drill sites. Current evidence suggests environmental and health risks further than the 600-foot recommendation. Many communities near oil extraction in Los Angeles are home to vulnerable populations, many of whom face cumulative environmental burdens. Exposure to toxins and air pollutants have shown to be higher near areas near drilling sites, including in Los Angeles. <coughs> the scientific literature demonstrates adverse human health impacts from exposure to these chemicals. Acute inhalation exposure to petroleum hydrocarbons have found increased risk of eye infection, migraine headaches, skin problems, loss of smell, coughing, nosebleeds, stress, and as well as asthma symptoms. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Pantoja, you're speaking on item number one. I actually signed up to do number three. But oh, I'm sorry, you're right, you're right. You did, you number three, my mistake, go ahead. Um, hello, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Amanda Pantoja, and I'm here to represent Food and Water Action. I'm also a resident from Huntington Park, California, which is in southeast LA. I'm here to voice my support to shut down Playa del Rey facility and pass the 2,500 feet setback. According to several technical studies, it is proven that Playa del Rey facility does leak and is one of the most dangerous storage facilities that only represents 1% of gas storage. This facility is proven to release harmful chemicals into communities where children go to school, people work, and families grow. The current permit is, it operates under, which may I add has been outdated since 1955, states that the facility must, quote, minimize hazards to children and have no escapes of gases. Thus, not only must the Playa del Rey shut down permanently, this also coincides with the need to ensure that all oil facilities have a 2,500 feet human health and safety ordinance. These issues are ones of justice for communities of color, workers, and the planet. Thus, I urge you to listen to the communities most affected and take a stand against fossil fuels. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amanda DeRosa, yes. followed by Anna Parks. Thank you for having me here today. Good afternoon, council members. The Los Angeles Petroleum Administrator's Office recently released a setback report. Buried in that report on page 145, it reads, this report should not lead to any public panic or believe in a widespread public health crisis. There is a lack of empirical evidence correlating oil and gas operations with the city, within the city of Los Angeles to widespread negative health impacts. The lack of evidence of public health impacts from oil and natural gas operations has been demonstrated local in multiple studies by the County Department of Public Health, the County Oil and Gas Strike Team, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, the Kern County Environmental Impact Report, and their Health Risk Assessment. I ask you all, that report estimates that impact or imposing a setback on the City of Los Angeles would cost upwards of $97 billion. 
are all to stop a public health crisis that doesn't actually have a proven correlation here? What is the sense in that when you could better spend that money impacting an actual public health crisis like homelessness rather than threatening the jobs of thousands of Angelinos and forcing them into homelessness Thank themselves? You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Anna Park. <laughs> Anna. Anna, you're speaking on item number one. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm here to speak in favor of the 2,500 foot setback. I live near Normandy and 27th, um, equidistant between two oil sites with pipes that I assume run under my yard. I have three children, middle and high school. They attended grade school near Arlington and Adams, about 500 yards from a drill site. My family attends church at Catalina and Jefferson, about 350 yards from a drill site. My kids' favorite park when they were little was located 350 yards from a drill site. When kids are at school or playing in a park or even going to church, they breathe a lot. Um, and my children have been breathing toxins related to oil drilling their entire lives. This didn't trouble me when I didn't know what those toxins were, but for six years, our neighborhood has been working hard to educate ourselves and to organize related to this issue. Um, now that we know, I'm very troubled and concerned and would like to see our children's Thank safety protected. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, members, I want to make a note that we still have way over 100 cards. I'm going to go ahead and allow another 40 minutes of public comment because I know some of you have to leave to your uh, uh, other committees and prior commitments, and I, we do still need to hear the presentation from the Petroleum Administrator. So I'm going to call names. Again, I'm going to go ahead and allow another 40 minutes of public comment, and then we need to get to on to the presentation. Is Ann is, uh, Kirkpatrick here? Ann Kirkpatrick? Anthony Davis? Are you Anthony Davis, sir? Yes. Come on up. Antonio Rodriguez, Jr.? Antonio Rodriguez? What is your name, sir? Have I called your name? Chris Olson, you speak in form. Uh, no, that doesn't work that way. Uh, you, you filled out a card, you need to, you need to come forward. Uh, Ant Antonio Rodriguez, hold on for this, guys. We're trying to get through this list. So Anthony, Anthony Davis, you don't wish to speak? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anne Kirkpatrick, Antonio Rodriguez, Braham. Braham, I thought I saw you. There you are. Barbara Hensley. Barbara. Bhavna, are you here? Come on up. Kamari Bazier. Kamari Bazier. Christian Castro. Christopher Ellis. Okay, see if they don't, if they don't <laughs> come up. Okay. Baham, go ahead. Item number one. One, thank you. Ms. Bahram Fazali, I'm <clears throat> co-chair of Stand LA and policy director at Communities for a Better Environment. Uh, this initiative is an exciting opportunity for bringing EJ communities and labor together for win-win solutions that both creates jobs, good jobs, union jobs, and, pro and improves um, quality of life for frontline communities. If there ever was a place to identify a low-hanging fruit to create a smart just transition pilot program, this is it. We have an obligation to invest in training folks and enhance opportunities in vastly expanding EV, EV infrastructure, la launching offshore wind projects, building resilient distributed generation, building decarbonization, energy efficiency, and constructing adaptation spaces throughout Los Angeles. We can and we must create a cleaner, safer, more resilient Los Angeles for frontline communities while growing unionized workforce to meet the needs of emerging economy. Thank you, Braham. Um, Ma'am, what is your name? Ann Kirkpatrick. Okay, just called you. Thank you. And Antonio Rodriguez, are you, are you here? They're not here. Barbara Hensley. Okay, Bhavna, go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Bhavna Shamasinder. I'm an associate professor in the Urban and Environmental Policy Department at Occidental College 
here in LA, along with Dr. Johnston at USC and 13 other scientists who conduct research on oil and gas or public health, we submitted a letter to City Council that reviews the evidence. I urge you to consider the weight and direction of the evidence that demonstrates in the peer-reviewed literature um, that uh, demonstrates adverse health impacts from a half a mile to three miles. The most worrisome impacts we see across several scientific studies are perinatal impacts or impacts to the unborn child. These carry across generations, mother to baby. We also see evidence of childhood leukemia and respiratory harm detailed in our letter. You should have all received it. The report by the petroleum engineer notes a 600 foot setback that is not based on the scientific evidence and is insufficient to protect public health. Given that we see harm up to three miles, oil drilling in our neighborhoods is a significant public health concern. I urge city council to consider this and take meaningful public health protective action. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. What is your name? I'm Barbara Hensley. Okay, I, I have you. Go ahead, Ann. You're speaking on item number three? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ann Kirkpatrick. I'm here in favor of Council Member Bonin's motion to investigate the storage, the operations and permits of the Playa del Rey gas storage facility. Um, I live in Marina del Rey. I've lived there for 26 years, and I am looking into some place to move to because I am in fear for my health and my safety. Um, I've learned a lot of facts in the last year. Um, through working with Protect Ply Now and finding about all this um, information that's public knowledge, just about all the leaks of uh, cancer-causing gases, and I've learned about what happened at Aliso Canyon, and I don't want that to happen in the marina. I'm very scared living there. I don't feel safe there anymore. There's facts proving that all the all the things that have uh, um, gone wrong with um, the gas storage facility there, and as far as jobs and homeless. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call a couple of more speakers. Kamari Bazier, are you here? Kamari. Christian Castro. Christopher Ellis. David Moncawa. David Moncawa. Dolly Godfrey. Don Martin. What is your name, sir? Don Martin. Don Martin? Yes. Okay, come on up. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, you're speaking on item number one. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Barbara Hensley here from the Sierra Club. I represent, uh, and I'm a volunteer here for this regional area. And I am in, in the Sierra Club is in support of the 2,500 foot uh, buffer zone. Um, the health Department of the County, of course, did a report citing health effects associated with oil drilling. So I don't think it's fair to say there are no health effects. And what I'd like to uh, ask about is when we're talking about the economics of it, what is uh, the cost to a neonatal uh, uh, a neonate who's born prematurely. What is the cost to society? What is the cost to that family? What is the cost, the economic cost, to a teenager who's been diagnosed with asthma and, and their job prospects are limited and they're going to have medical care uh, for the rest of their life? What is the health care cost to a woman with three children who's diagnosed with cancer? What is the cost to society of that? Thank you, Thank you Barbara. Those are costs. Don, before you get started, let me let me call a couple more speakers. Doe Spack, are you here? Douglas Stewart? Eddie Coe? Elijah Mohammed? Flora Camargo? Sir, what is your name? Eddie Coe. Eddie Coe, thank you. Elijah Mohammed? Flora Camargo? Are you, are you Flora? Yes, here. Okay. Flora, come on up. What is your name? I'm Beatriz Carrillo, but I'm a student at Puerto Los Angeles High School. And we what is, I don't think I've going. called your name yet. They, they have to take okay, I'm sorry. Hold on for just a second. Everybody here has been waiting. You just don't, don't interrupt my meeting. Hold on for just a second. I work with my staff on your speakers. Can you please, if I haven't called your name, um, I need you to please take a seat. Thank you. Back in the audience. Work with my staff, and then we'll figure it out. But you have to work with our staff. You can't just interrupt the meeting. Um, Flora, are you Flora? Flora, sí. Okay, gracias. Gabriela Garcia. Gabriela Garcia. Okay, go ahead, um, Mr. Martin, go ahead. You're speaking on item number one. 
Oh, mine? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, Mr. Martin. Okay. Thank Item you, Madam one. Chairman, for allowing me to address you once again. I understand the economics behind this, and I don't want to diminish anybody's right to work. But I think I should bring out to the committee that there's an overriding right that we have, and that's the right to life. That's what you're being asked to determine at this point, whether or not we have the right to life. You see, at each one of these locations, there's a line, a sign posted that these locations contain chemicals that the state of California knows to cause cancer, birth defects, and other reproductive harm. So not only are we affected as adults, but also our children. And as a result of those chemicals, I have lost my wife. She died as a result of being exposed to these chemicals. And my granddaughter has contacted leukemia, I'm, I'm sorry, Hodgkin's lymphoma as a, as, as a result of that. So we're asking you to preserve our right to life. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, Eddie Cole? Eddie, you're speaking on item number one as well? Yes. Okay, then go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Eddie Coe. I live in South LA. Uh, my house that my wife and I bought five years ago is a few blocks away from the Jefferson drill site. Uh, we have two daughters. Olive is four years old and Violet is two years old. And I'm afraid to have my children play outside in our backyard, in our front yard. Uh, you know, I have anxiety when putting my kids in the car because Olive insists on putting herself in the straps and Violet is two years old and wants to do everything that her older sister does. So it's, it's a constant nightmare that I have of the exposure that they have to, to the drilling, the, the chemicals in the air. Um, I also attend church a few blocks away from there. Uh, from the Jefferson Drill site. Uh, one block from there, you know, I've been volunteering with uh, the church youth group. So middle school and high school students that we've had uh, one block from that drilling site, right? And this has been going on for so many years. Thank you, Mr. Thank Coy. You. Well, sir, what is your name? Douglas Spat. Doug Spat. Hold it. Give me just a second. Let me call a couple of more speakers. Uh, Beatriz Carrillo, you want to come back up? Uh, is Elijah Mohammed here? How about Gabriela Garcia? Okay, well, if she needs, there's microphones there and speakers, so. Are you Gabriela Garcia? Come on up. Uh, don't worry about it. I know it's chaotic. I uh, just want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to speak. Hi, sorry, I was a No, no, no. Uh, uh, okay. Um, Hi, my name is oh, Gabriela. No, 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 not, not yet, not oh, yet. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so why don't we let Ms. Beatriz Carrillo speak, because she needs to catch a bus. And I think her friends are here with her. So Beatriz, you have one minute. I'm sorry, you've got two minutes because you're speaking on items number one and number three. Is that correct? So I think your friends want to line behind you. Is that what's happening? Okay. All right. Beatriz, go ahead. You've got two minutes on items number one and number three. My name is Beatriz. Forgive me for interrupting, but okay. I'm a student at Port of Los Angeles High School, a resident in Wilmington, and a Youth for Environmental Justice member with Communities for a Better Environment. Wilmington is highly concentrated with oil drilling sites in all of LA. We do not need oil drilling sites in all of LA. <laughs> we do not. Um, I've lived 400 feet from an oil drilling site. I constantly have walked to and from school, would pass the oil drilling site. In 2014, there was a 1,200 crude oil spill on my street in front of my house. There was no evacuation put in place. Instead, my neighbors received $100 gas gift cards and breakfast burrito, which I found unuseful for my health and many others. My, many of my neighbors were unaware of it and didn't act on it because no one in my city council nor a representative came out and showed support or value to us. At the end of the day, we simply had to put up with the most disgusting, unforgettable odor that entered our lungs. 600 feet is not safe for our communities. My peers are here and in two other flow rooms standing in solidarity with community to gain real action for our, our front line. 2,500 setback is a necessity. There is no more need for waiting. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I know these young people have to catch a bus, so I appreciate you. Just work with my staff, and we can accommodate folks as quickly as possible. So, But thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a safe ride back home. I'm in the back. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. So, Flora, you're next, followed by Doug. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then Gabriela. Go ahead, Flora. Go ahead. Okay, let me try, try my English, okay? Okay, my again. Next. Let me, me practice my English. Maybe quiet it down so we can hear you. Just quiet it down just a okay. little bit. Quiet, please. The, the, Thank you. Okay. okay. Close the door so we can quiet down the room. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hi. My name is Flora Camargo. I'm a Wilmington resident like uh, 30 years ago. Um, okay. Um, I'm here for, um, we are going to concerns. We need a safe distance for the oil drills, at least at 2,500 feet. You know, some of the people, my relatives, they are dying. They have passed away already from cancer. In 25 years, I lost already 10 people. You know, my heart is broken already. And I'm three more close to me, and they're dying for lung cancer. Um, and, my, and that's my concern about my community and about the regulation they have they put in the refineries. And I'm here to ask you to support the 2,500 distance for the oil drills. It's easy, and that's all I can say. Okay? I know I have a time. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Doug. You're Hello. speaking on item, general public Number comment one. is all I have you on? Number one, ma'am. Just one? Yes. Okay. I don't want. Go ahead. My name is Douglas Spat, and I've been an oil field operator in the city of Los Angeles for 30 years. Every action has an opposite reaction, and setbacks are no different. If we enact the new setbacks to the public health concerns, you must also um, allow the development around existing wells. This will not immediately impact oil operations or put them out of business, but rather you will force hospitals, schools, senior centers, and hundreds if not thousands of residents who have homes and businesses permitted in the city of LA um, with these setback zones. At a time when homelessness and all the other problems that we have, it seems short-sighted that these policies could be considered by this council. Um, with the last couple of minutes, um, I understand the setbacks, but everybody needs to realize that if you look at the old pictures that are around the city, everybody lives on an old oil field, and everybody seems to be pretty healthy for the most part in L.A. and lives a very nice lifestyle. And with the four seconds I have left, I want to come out against uh, solar energy. I'm a light-skinned guy, and, so, and the sun causes a lot of skin cancer. So we might want to do something about that. Thank That's you, how sir. silly this is. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Gabriela, before you speak, uh, before you speak, I'm going to call another couple of speakers. Gina Burnett, Godfrey Washira, Godfrey Washira, Gus Torres, Hermalinda Alvarado. Who says Hermalinda uh, Alvarado? Okay. Uh, Sir, what is your name? Gus Torres. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hugo Garcia. Hugo Garcia, you want to come on up? Okay, Gabriela, you're speaking on item number one. Yeah, um, yes. So my name is Gabriela, and I um, live in CD1. I live right around the corner from Alenco Oil Well. So that's, uh, I always say I live in a toxic triangle. I'm, I live right wedged between the, where the 110 and the 10 meet, and then there's an oil well between downtown and USC. Uh, my family has lived there for 40 years, and my ch I've raised both my kids there, and we take walks with our dogs across, you know, every day down that street. And we, you know, my neighbors and other neighbors have uh, began a campaign called People Not Pozos because we really want to ensure that we are looking at people before a lot of, you know, to put them ahead of any profits and really put our health at the center of this. We really are um, advocating for the setback. You know, my, a lot of my neighbors have experienced, um, you know, early births, reproductive issues, a lot of nosebleeds, my children uh, as well. And so I think we have began as a community, began to reimagine because we are in the middle of a housing crisis to see if we can transform this site into affordable housing or a community right, thank serving. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Linda Alvarado? 
Ah, un momentito. ¿Va, va a hablar en, en um, la agenda número uno? ¿Necesita traducción? No. No, it's okay. I'm You're going to say it in English? English? Sir, what is your name? Uh, Godfrey Washira. You what is my name? Godfrey Washira. Oh, Godfrey. Okay, got, yeah. I got you. Hold on for just a second. Go ahead. You're speaking on item. Can you bring up um, Hermalinda Alvarado so I can know what item she's speaking on? Item number one. Okay. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Armelinda. I'm here to make you a petition today. Please do something to keep distance, the distance of uh, 2,500 foot between the oil wheels and the houses. Please do it for our health. I have my sister that is a cancer survivor. Also, my niece had bone cancer. Uh, my sister was 34 and my niece was only 10 years old. My niece um, lives uh, one block away from one of the oil wells. If you were living in the same situation where, where your family is having cancer because of the oil wells, you would not think the way you do now. Like nothing is happening. We are in, in your hands and you are the only ones that can do this possible, please. A lot of people are suffering from cancer in Wilmington. Um, also, they're suffering from um, a lot of respiratory uh, illness, like asthma. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Gus Torres, followed by Hugh Garcia. You're speaking on item number one. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Gus Torres. I'm here on behalf of UA Local 250 pipe fitters, welders, and apprentices. And uh, I want to remind you that the jobs created by the industry benefit people from across California, across many diverse ethnic and class backgrounds. Imposing a setback will lead the sh to the shutdown of some oil and gas production in the city of LA, which would devastate hundreds of families that will be forced out of work. Governor Brown said a world without oil is not an option. Let's keep the jobs local, the workers and the residents safe, and the environment, environment closely monitored, rather than sending the industry off to a third world countries. Thank you for your time and God bless. Thank you. Ma'am, what's your name? Gina Burnett. Uh, I can't hear you. Gina Burnett. Gina Burnett, got it. Okay. Um, go ahead, Mr. Garcia, followed by Mr. Godfrey. Yeah. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Council Members. Hugo Garcia, Campaign Coordinator for Environmental Justice from Esperanza Community Housing and the People Not Pozos Campaign and Stand LA. Last year's city controller's uh, report on oil revealed how little public revenue oil extraction generates for the city. In fact, oil drilling is literally a fraction of a percent of LA's overall economy and tax base. Tales of major economic collapse and job loss from a buffer ordinance are grossly exaggerated. But the repurposing of oil sites for other purposes can have enormous economic and tax benefits for the city. In the community I work in around the Allen Co. drill site, community members of one of the city's top planning firms are already thinking about a future use of the site, about how creative public and uh, private affordable partnerships can help address needs for affordable housing or community space and create jobs in the process. Please support the 2,500 foot buffer. It's an environmental justice issue. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go. Um, Mr. Washira, you're speaking on item number one. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Godfrey Washira. I'm with Creed LA, and we're here to oppose the setbacks. I uh, just had talk about just transition for workers, uh, but we had that illusion with manufacturing jobs, and when they talked about jobs of the future. You see, in a society, you can lose a thousand jobs paying 40 bucks an hour and create a thousand jobs paying 15 bucks an hour. At the end of the day, there are no job losses, but the quality of life has just gone down. And that's what's going to happen if we impose these setbacks. That's the real, one of the real economic costs that we're going to incur. And I think now is not the time to go down the path of losing good paying jobs. Not when we have the homelessness, not when we have the housing situation. I think we need to protect all the good paying jobs. And finally, Reading the report, for me to just, the setbacks is nothing more than a bad solution looking for a problem. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
We have another 10 minutes before I close public comment. So I'm going to call a couple of more speakers. Ignacio Gutierrez. Ignacio Iritha Wormsley. Iritha. Jamal Paul. Jamal Hayner. Jasmine Vargas. Sir, what is your name? Jamal, okay, go ahead and sit, go ahead and take a seat. <clears throat> Javier Martinez, Jamison Vargas. Javier Martinez, okay, go ahead and sit down. <clears throat> Javier Savala. Javier Savala's not, I don't see anyone here. Jed Smith. Jed Smith. Okay, uh, Gina, why don't you go ahead and you're speaking on item number one. Yes. Good afternoon, council members. Gina Burnett on behalf of Creed LA. Unlike other oil producing countries where workers don't have the same rights and job conditions are dangerous, jobs in the oil and gas industry here in California are reliable and safe. Why would we want to stop the industry here and fund industry in other countries? where there are human rights issues and poor environmental oversight. We share concerns about our local air quality, but other factors need to be considered. Imposing the setback distances will disrupt the local economy without improving public health, since there are many other factors that affect health outcomes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Jamal Poe, item Jam number one. My name is Jamal Poe, and I'm a L.A. resident up under the United Steel Workers. I work for Thailand's oil production company, and I support and totally against anyone that's want to get rid of all our jobs in our community because there is a lot of homelessness, there's a lot of poverty, and there's a lot of people who's out of work. The housing industry is ridiculous with price and you know there's a lot of low paying jobs and I just want to stand behind the people that's fighting for their jobs. That's it. Thank you. The two speakers that just joined me, what are your names? Jed Smith. Jed Smith. And Tamara Hainer. Okay, got it. Um, is there a um, Mayan Golden Krasner here? <coughs> Sir, what is your name? Javier Zavala. Okay. So why don't we go ahead, um, Javier Martinez. Do you need a translator? Yes. Buenas tardes, miembros del Consejo. Me llamo Javier Martinez. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Javier Martinez. I reside in the area of uh, University Park. In the district of Concejal Gil Cedillo. In this uh, Gil Cedillo's district. En lo general es una comunidad de bajos ingresos donde la mayoría de es de origen latino. This is a low income community and mostly uh, most of the residents are Latinos. Nuestra comunidad vive al lado del pozo de Allen Co Energy. We live right next to the Alenco Energy um, oil, oil, oil drilling. Well, en la comunidad hemos sufrido de varios uh, problemas de salud que van desde dolores de cabeza, náusea y mareos. We have had several problems, we, such as nausea, headaches, and others. Hay muchos residentes que se han enfermado por los químicos que se utilizan. Many of the residents have uh, become ill because of the different. Uh, um, uh, chemicals that are being used. Problemas que pueden llegar incluso o que han llegado a, a problemas en el embarazo. Also, women have suffered, the pregnant women have been affected. El uso de estos químicos está plenamente demostrado que daña la salud. So it has been, um, it's a fact that these chemicals are affecting our health. Es por eso que les pido que apoyen la barrera de los 1500 pies. Es una responsabilidad De todos de poner la salud de las personas en primer lugar. So I am asking you to support the 2500 setback. I think that it is our duty 
to, um, to take care of our health and to do something about it. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Gracias. Um, uh, can I have, is Maya in here? Yeah. You, oh, there you are. So Jed Smith, go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jed Smith. I'm with the California Nurses Association. We represent approximately 100,000 registered nurses in the state of California and more than 10,000 registered nurses in the city of Los Angeles. We hope today we can all avoid talking points written by oil industry lobbyists to aim to divide working people from each other and treat actual workers at oil drilling sites as fodder. We'd rather talk about the future for those workers affected by nothing less than just transition and a real workforce development plan to get workers into stable, safe, unionized jobs. We want a plan that is developed as we set in place policies to protect thousands of Angelinos from the dangers of neighborhood oil drilling and the devastating health impact it has and will continue to have on our communities, which we see every day in the hospitals where we represent the nurses. Our members firmly believe that workers in frontline communities with a united and forward-thinking labor movement allied with the environmental justice movement can make this kind of just transition possible. We urge our elected officials to provide the leadership to make this plan possible, and we are eager to start the needed dialogue with any workers' union or other stakeholders to want, who wants a seat at the table when the inevitable decisions are made to enact the real much. safety buffer. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Javier Savala? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you for this time to speak. Um, I'd like to say that petroleum produces more than just gasoline. Uh, it seems like the city ignores the role petroleum plays in building materials, medical devices, and hospitals, zero emission vehicles, renewable energy components, and thousands of products essential to modern society. Petroleum serves as the asphalt that paves our roads, the heating and cooking source that most homes and restaurants and many other products that we consume each day, like lotion, makeup, clothing, plastics, etc. Shutting down local oil production means that you would have to import all of these items, driving up costs, increasing harmful VOC emissions, and leading to project delays. And prioritizing the use of locally produced oil and gas ensures that the environment is protected. Our economy <clears throat> retains well-paying jobs and valuable tax revenues while keeping prices for goods and gas low. Thank you very much. Uh, ¿Cómo se llama? Ignacio Gutiérrez. Ignacio Gutiérrez. Um, okay. Uh, your name? I read the one. All right. Thank you. Um, and you, your name? Okay. So you will be the last speaker. Okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead and go to tomorrow? Perfect. Um, good evening, afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, committee members. Um, my name is Jamara Hayner. I'm the co-chair of the Greater Los Angeles African American Chamber of Commerce. We applaud this committee and the city council and the administrator and other city staff for their leadership on this issue. This report is part of the solution, but even at 164 pages, it's not enough. You've heard a lot today about the economic impact of possible setbacks, mainly from our brothers and sisters in labor. Um, and but we haven't heard enough from what this would do for black owned businesses. LA has done so much for our businesses, for your investments in infrastructure at the airport and other places and we thank you for that. We're making long term plans and sudden changes are terrifying to our community. So we ask you to thoroughly study the impact which this report just unfortunately hasn't done. LA has come a very long way in treating black business owners finally with some respect. Um, so we'd like to make sure we continue to have a seat at the table through thorough study. Can the industry do better? Yes. Do we need a Green New Deal? Hell yes. Just let us be part of the plan, not just a plan in a CLA report. Let us know what that plan is to make sure we're not going to be left behind. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maya? Good afternoon. My name is Maya Golden Krasner. I'm an attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Because the report entirely under misunderstands takings law, the report grossly overestimates the potential payouts the city would make. First, it ignores the fact that an amortization period would mitigate most claims. Second, no one is entitled to all of the oil left in the ground. Third, even if someone can make a valid takings claim, the standard remedy is to extend the amortization period, not pay out cash. As to cleanup costs, owners, operators, and the state would, like, would all be likely to cover many, if not most, of the costs. And if the city implements a polluter pays policies, then any further costs would be substantially diminished. 
Finally, the report fails to analyze the public benefits and cost savings um, from a buffer zone. So for all of these reasons, and there are all, because there are such limited circumstances under which the city would make cash payouts to mineral rights owners, the cost of the health and safety buffer would be substantially less than the report's projections. All right, thank you. Uh, Ignacio Gutierrez? Hello. No, it's no okay. No. All right, so you're speaking on item number one. Yes, okay, my name is Ignacio Gutierrez, and I live in South LA near the, the Jefferson uh, oil site and the Lenko oil site. And day in and day out, I see children uh, sick of asthma, nosebleeds, and all these different diseases. And I support the 2,500 uh, uh, buffer zone. I think that this will help our children and our communities that are affected by these two oil drilling sites. And uh, I support the bond, the bond, the bond in, uh, measure. And thank you, and I hope to, uh, that we pass this uh, 2,500 buffer zone uh, for, for the safety of our children. Thank you, and you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Iretha? Yeah. You're speaking on item number one? Yes. Go ahead. My name is Iretha. I'm with the org. I'm a community leader with SCOPE, and I'm also standing with Stand LA today because I'm here as a person that has lost a lot of friends and family to cancer. There are so many of my friends' children that have asthma. I've never seen these many people die of cancer and have asthma and nosebleeds. It's unnecessary because 2,500 feet is not a lot to ask to save and give children the quality of life they need. And the elderly people, these are people that can't fight for themselves. But if you just make an effort to do that, it will give people a better quality of life. I don't think anybody in here wants to live next to an oil drilling site and risk dying from something that could be preventable. And so I'm representing those that can't speak for themselves as well as relatives and friends that I have lost because of this situation. Uh, Jasmine. Thank you so much, um, esteemed council member. My name is Jasmine Vargas. I am the senior organizer with Food and Water Action. I am a longtime, lifelong Los Angeles resident, and I'm here uh, because I see that there's a false dichotomy being placed in front of you between uh, the environment versus jobs and workers. And I want to set the record straight. We are here for the workers and for the communities that live next to these facilities. Food and Water Action and Food and Water Watch support the 2,500 foot setback. For oil drilling, we support the investigation into Playa del Rey gas storage facility because these are hands down dangerous facilities. Right now we are even seeing a fire at the uh, refinery in Rodeo, right now burning in these communities and we have to call it out for what it is. These fossil fuel infrastructures are dangerous. We need to make sure that they are um, being held accountable, but that workers also right. need to have a just transition. So I'm actually here to talk about Thank Elon you. phase one and two. Elon phase yeah. one and two, the solar project needs to be put up in Thank this you, council. Your time is up. Thank you. Uh, members, that concludes. That concludes general public comment, uh, including all items on today's agenda. So uh, can you go ahead and please read items one, two, and three into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number one, Board of Public Works report relative to current city land use code in connection with oil and gas sites and health impacts. Number two, also a Public Works report relative to establishing an annual oil and gas facilities inspection program. And number three, Motion, Bonn, and Coretz relative to instructing the planning department to work with the petroleum administrator and various city departments to investigate oil, natural gas, gas storage operations at Playa del Rey Field. All right, thank you very much. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask the members of the public if you can please lower your voice. We're about to uh, begin our presentation. If I can please call up um, our petroleum administrator to give us an overview of the oil and gas health report. I would also like to ask the city attorney and the planning department to stand by in case there's any questions from the committee. Um, and Uruwak, why don't you go ahead and walk us through the content of your report, your approach, uh, what was covered, and how you came up with this set of recommendations, okay? 
Great. And um, is there a, is there a handout that you? I did. Uh, Honorable Chairwoman, I did provide a, a right, printout of the PowerPoint presentation, and there's also a copy of frequently asked questions that should have been shared. Um, so go good ahead. afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to have this hearing today. I'm Udawak Joentuk, the city's patrolling administrator. Uh, this is for, um, sorry, let's get here. Council file 17-0447, uh, feasibility of amending current city and land use codes in connection with health impacts of oil and gas wells and drilling sites. Um, we'll go through the presentation uh, and then happy to, to open the floor for any questions. Um, so why don't you walk us through the report and then when, so that we're not interrupting the flow of the presentation, we can hold questions till the end, but have you walk us through the report for it. Go sure. ahead. The report is a compilation of 61,000 pages of documents. Um, we uh, were reliant uh, partially on the County Public Health Department. Uh, as long, we also retained uh, expert uh, consultants to provide us with uh, information. Uh, just a general overview of show administrator role covers uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream within the city. Um, overview of the oil and gas sites in the city, that there's 26 oil fields that uh, intersect city boundaries. There's over 70 oil fields in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, this report was the first time we updated the uh, inventory of oil and gas wells and drill sites in the city. Some of the data had not been updated since 1990 uh, or, or, late, or even 2000. And so all the, the most recent 2019 data is updated uh, in the city records and also shared with multiple departments, such as the city planning department. Um, and we worked really with the state agency to get that information updated. Uh, the city of LA produces approximately 1% to 2% of the state of California's oil production. We're producing about 8,000 barrels a day. Uh, for context, in the 60s, we were doing 140,000 barrels a day in LA. So we are order of magnitude smaller. Um, these are the 11 items that were uh, directed to by the council to report back on. There was multiple amendments made to the original uh, motion and committee hearing, and then amendments made prior to adoption by the council. But what are the health and environmental impacts to drill sites? What distance of setback and potential mitigation measures? Evaluation of various types of materials used at oil and gas drill sites. Evaluation of different types of drill sites. What agencies govern and regulate? A summary of the uh, county health uh, guidance. Any recommendations to coordinate? Uh, or any recommendations from the county on health impacts or health risk assessments? Uh, any recommendation to enhance public health coordination between uh, the city and other agencies, uh, draft MOU. Uh, an example uh, are the economic employment and fiscal impacts uh, of implementing a setback, and then analysis of human rights standards and environmental standards of countries exporting oil to the Los Angeles refineries were the uh, final 11 uh, directives. Uh, this is a picture of the drill sites across LA. There's approximately 17 uh, sites. One is inactive, so 16 sites. Um, and it may be hard to tell, but the, the dotted yellow lines are the different oil fields, like the Salt Lake field, the Sawtell, the La Cienega, the downtown LA field. Just to give a, a, an idea of some of these drill sites are behind uh, facades, like fake office buildings, or uh, the one even looks like a shul, um, or they're behind a 10-foot wall over by USC. So there's um, uh, even there's a former drill site in Pacoima by the Pacoima Wash is the old Paxson drill site that's uh, an abandoned lot today. Um, so of the, the 18 active fields, there's um, approximately 650 to 870 active oil wells. Um, <clears throat> in the report, you will see by every council district uh, what oil fields, how many wells, how many drill sites are in each um, city council district across the city. So that, that's itemized in the report. But this just summarizes the 23 oil fields uh, in the city and the different um, active, idle, plugged, buried wells that are uh, spread out throughout the city. Uh, and there's a graph there of the oil and gas production in the city. There actually, in the past five years, hasn't been any oil drilling uh, happening in Los Angeles. Just this year, there were nine wells uh, that were approved in Wilmington, uh, but that's the first time in nearly half a decade. Uh, so the public health report uh, was informative. They uh, 
this came from LA County Public Health Department, and they recommended at least a 300 foot setback. Uh, this is for generally countywide, not specific to LA. Uh, they recommend implementing continuous air monitoring, uh, an annual local inspection program, uh, comprehensive safety plans, and enhanced emergency preparedness plans, and then site specific health risk assessments. Uh, and plus, trying to find ways to improve uh, coordination with stakeholders when we're in a non emergency situation. So their report was about 50 pages uh, and, and was the basis. Uh, they also did an epidemiological literature review. And um, be interesting to note, they, they found uh, uh, inconclusive information in the body of literature to uh, say a specific setback distance for the entire county, but they did make a minimum threshold recommendation. Uh, we retained Dr. Seth Shonkoff from Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers uh, for Healthy Energy, PSE, um, who generated two documents for us. One was a, li a, a literature review uh, that looked at everything that was in the county public health uh, report, that looked at uh, what was a state bill called SB4 that did a LA, a LA Basin EIR and looked at any new data uh, and re research that came out uh, after that report. And they also uh, generated a chemical inventory analysis where they looked at the disclosure information provided to the South Coast Air Quality Management District of the type of chemicals um, that were there. We did identify some additional chemicals that are on site that are disclosed to the fire department through what's called CUPA, uh, the Certified Unified Program Agency. Um, that's like uh, corrosion chemical, paints, thinners, other type of thing, but that was, while we have information of those chemicals, they're not publicly disclosable, uh, but they were not analyzed uh, by our, our consultant. So these were the recommendations of the consultant that we retained. Uh, conduct additional health studies in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and to note that, yes, the literature did find uh, health impacts from 0.1 to 1 mile in distance, uh, but the super majority of those reports are hydraulic fracturing, uh, and gas shill sediment in other states, such as Texas, Pennsylvania, Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, which is a fundamentally different type of geology, uh, geochemistry, and type of operations. Uh, in LA, we are just, uh, we're called conventional operations. We're low volume, low production. We mainly produce water. We're not producing high volumes, high pressure natural gas like in uh, Pennsylvania. And so uh, that was the first recommendation. Uh, he too also recommended uh, field-based air monitoring near sensitive receptors, just like the county did. Uh, recommended implementing some uh, minimum setback distance, but could not give a specific distance. Um, recommend utilizing the best available technologies for mitigation. Consider limiting density of wells within the city. Uh, the you know, no matter where, the research shows that if you have a higher density of wells, you have a higher concentration of fluids and the, higher, uh, and the chemicals. And so uh, limiting that density of high density wells. Most of the drill sites have uh, are high density or anywhere from 10 to 200 oil wells in a specific location. The largest being the Wilmington drill site um, off of Anaheim Road that has 200, over 200 wells. Um, did recommend, he did identify there are chemicals of concern present, but we don't have any measurements uh, or empirical information to show that they are unhealthy levels or are sustained levels. Uh, and then also identify major data gaps. The uh, disclosure information, uh, only about 30% of it is usable. There was a number of redundancies and errors um, that we, we couldn't use to analyze because it was uh, indecipherable what, what was there. Uh, but the recommendation was that set Back distances should not be the only policy. Uh, it should be in, in, uh, in, comprehensive, in, in collaboration with some other uh, policy. Uh, we did look at setbacks around the country. Um, and you can look, uh, they go anywhere from uh, 300 feet to uh, 2,000 feet. But again, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, most all of these uh, are for future development. It did not impact any existing development. So the challenge is uh, if you make a setback distance that's going to impact existing development, that is a, a uncharted territory that hasn't been uh, addressed either economically or legally before. And then you look at like the state of Maryland, who has a 2,000 foot setback, they only have 10 wells in the entire state. 
and those are all natural gas wells. And so it's not, a, again, a fair comparison to say, well, Mar Maryland's at 2,000, we should be at 2,000. And so we did look at the city of Arvin, which is here in California, in Kern County. They have recently implemented in 2018 a setback distance, 300 foot for new development and 600 foot from sensitive sites. Uh, however, neither future or existing distance impacted any development. They are a very rural, low density, um, small populated city. Uh, but it was interesting and uh, it's an attachment. Uh, Attorney General Javier Becerra wrote explicitly to Arvin that depending on how they implement it, if it did impact existing production, it could potentially uh, be preempted by the state. And so that it would be in conflict with the, the state of California's um, uh, objective. So um, there, there is some legal uncertainty again there uh, impacting existing production. But uh, basically everything was for future uh, development, all the existing setbacks. And then just one last example, like in, in, in Dallas, in Texas, they have 1,500 foot setback, but that's it. You can spill, you can emit, you can leak all day long, as long as you're within 1,500 feet. It has no mitigations, no rules, no regulations. It's just, you just have a, a separated distance. Uh, this is a map that shows both at 500 and 1,500 foot, the different um, impacted areas, um, the red, it's difficult to see uh, on the projector, but the, the red dots uh, with the yellow outline as a distance. Um, so on the left uh, is 500 feet, on the right is 1,500 feet. Uh, you impact basically uh, all, all the drill sites at 1,500 feet. Uh, and there's, um, there is also um, non-drill sites out in CD12 called uh, Cascade Mountain, just north of O'Melveny, O'Melveny Park, uh, which is an open uh, drill site area, but no walls. Uh, they would be impacted at 1,500 feet. Um, and so it just kind of shows a comparison of the distances. There's a, additional maps uh, and attachments. There's over 140 attachments to this report. Uh, every research paper that was reviewed is, is public record now and on the council file. So anybody would like to review or dispute or uh, evaluate the information is available for them to do so. Um, the council did direct it to ask to look at uh, potential fiscal impacts and so there's a number of uh, uh, um, layers of the, of the onion there that we can unpeel. You have the current oil production uh, estimating conservatively uh, the price of the current oil production about 148 million dollars. Future oil reserves um, just taking today's oil price at the recoverable oil, there's about 1.6 billion barrels of recoverable. There's about 5 billion overall, so this is not recovering all the existing oil uh, that remains, and this is just under the city of LA, not LA basin-wide. Um, the surface land value, about 24 acres uh, that would be impacted, roughly $100 million. Uh, the well abandonment costs, um, we could not abandon the wells and just leave them unabandoned, but um, that, that would, not be uh, in the best public health and safety, but abandoning the wells is about 321 million. Cleanup costs, this is soil remediation, equipment removal, pipeline abandonment, uh, you know, estimated at $150 million uh, for all the sites. And then we, uh, you know, in talking to the city attorney, we, we do anticipate immediate litigation uh, that would be in the ballpark of a million dollars a year. Uh, this most likely would go to the state Supreme Court. So. You're looking at probably three to five year time frame uh, of litigation. But uh, so when we said what were the, the direct potential costs, that's uh, how we got to the $724 million. It is potential. There are things that could be done to minimize that. Uh, and then we looked at the jobs. We had a public hearing at the city's health commission where over 300 people came. Uh, we welcome and, and collected documents and reports. And so of the different competing economic reports given, you had between 575 to 1,221 jobs potentially impacted um, with if you were just focused on upstream uh, oil and gas economic impact. Uh, we were asked to look at the you know, crude oil uh, imports. Uh, we were able to, to get information from the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach to see what, are, what countries are we importing uh, the most oil from. Uh, and there, right, you can see it's Angola, Canada, Colombia, Ecuador, Iraq, Mexico, 
Panama, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, South Korea, and Uruguay. Um, we import into the, the twin ports about 130 million barrels of oil a year as of 2017, uh, and we produce about 2 million barrels a year. So uh, you can see the difference of how much we're importing just into Los Angeles refineries. Uh, and then we were asked to look at the human rights and environmental standards. We did, we were able to go out and find some uh, NGOs who do assessments on uh, human rights and, uh, and environmental standards so that we can do an apples to apples comparison. Uh, and you can see the index of, we only listed the countries that we import oil into the port of Long Beach or the port of LA. Um, uh, wide ranging uh, issues on human rights uh, from lack of women's rights, LGBT rights, um, extrajudicial killings. Uh, may be familiar with the uh, Washington Post journalist, Jamal Kajoji, who was killed in the Turkish embassy. Um, and uh, so that you see that. Uh, good news is uh, Canada is probably our best place to import oil from. Uh, they, they do rake high on freedoms and uh, also in their environmental performance. But there is a detailed and explicit uh, itemized country by country listing in the report uh, with additional information on OPEC countries and uh, what the State Department uh, says about each uh, of the country's uh, issues. So, um, in summarizing, um, the report's, you know, about 150 pages, uh, but we got down to um, the health department and our consultant were, were um, couldn't, couldn't agree on a, on a specific distance. And, um, but we looked at doing uh, a minimum setback of 600 feet, which is double what the county recommended. Uh, it's comparable to what the city of Arvin did. Um, which is the, beyond the minimum threshold of what's reviewed in the uh, literature review. Um, but we, we said that on existing wells. Part of the challenge is uh, we have the worst air quality in America um, and trying to uh, uh, do source apportionation or disaggregate is that pollution coming from refineries or diesel trucks or, or ships uh, is very challenging. Uh, and we didn't. We did not have that information to make that decision, uh, but we are participating in studies like AB 617, which is doing exactly that in Wilmington right now. But it's it's not been concluded. So uh, uh, we're recommending a 600 foot as um, uh, for existing, and then looking at future development. A 1500 foot impacts uh, most of the city, but you start to. Uh, meet uh, jurisdictional challenges uh, with Lawa, with airport, with other uh, cities, uh, unincorporated LA County. You have wells that start in LA and go into other cities. You have wells that start in other cities that come into LA that need to be unwind and, and dealt with uh, that have never been dealt with this way. And so uh, we looked at 1,500 foot for uh, future development. Uh, depending on what you do on one and two, you need to get uh, a legal analysis from the um, city attorney um, on how to implement that, whether it's the planning department, an individual ordinance. Um, there's a variety of different ways. Uh, you can establish a setback distance. It will require enhanced mitigations and technology. You can do a setback distance where everyone in the area has to move, or you can do a setback distance where all oil and gas operations in the area has to cease. And so each, depending on how you implement it, will have different legal ramifications. Um, also, we looked at the process of updating the city's oil code. Uh, it's a, you asked about mitigations. We went through uh, hundreds of documents of EIRs and came up with a series of uh, mitigations that we can put into the code to uh, manage vapor recovery systems, leak testing, um, annual inspections, quarterly inspections. There's things that we can put into the oil code that hasn't been, ever been done before to give uh, people uh, uh, peace of mind to know that uh, there is or there is not toxic air emissions at, at harmful levels coming from these sites. Um, LA County Public Health recommended a health risk assessment at each site, not a general citywide one, because each site is different in its geology and its location in the city. Uh, we are also recommending the emergency preparedness and community safety plans. Uh, you may know that fence line air monitoring is not listed here. Uh, because we are dealing with it in a different council file uh, action with the annual inspection program, which uh, is next on the agenda. But uh, we do, I do recommend that we do a fence line air monitoring program. Uh, but I didn't recommend it here because we're already doing it in, a, in another area. Um, there are 
studies that are happening now that we should participate in fully as a city. One is called SNAPS, uh, the study of neighborhoods adjacent to petroleum sites, which is evaluating what toxic chemicals uh, potentially could be emitted and should we be measuring for an offense line air monitoring system. And then AB 617 is the other uh, uh, information that will be informative uh, what should we be measuring for in a continuous offense line air monitoring system. Uh, we can designate health officer authority to LA County Fire Department uh, from, sorry, from the LA County to our LAFD. We can also transfer the hazardous waste generator program from LA County to LAFD. Uh, this will give us enhanced oversight and health authority to um, issue violations, do additional inspections, uh, and make sure that all the sites that are generating hazardous waste are inspected and are in compliance. Currently, uh, the county is in program improvement, uh, which means they're not meeting their responsibilities, and this would be a, um, actually a financial uh, uh, um, opportunity for LAFD to have some additional revenue and, and, and uh, staff up a little bit. Uh, we can add this to the city's legislative agenda as far as identifying funding for oil and gas studies. Um, there is work done by the state, but all the money that we uh, receive every year from oil and gas, we spend every year. So we don't, uh, we have not put in a restricted fund or allocated it for anything, which is uh, recommendation number 11, is to create a restricted fund. We get about $400,000 a year that we just spend in our um, general fund that could be used towards cleanup costs, um, remediation, consulting studies, um, but we just, we just spend all the money. And uh, also, we don't have a barrel tax. Uh, Long Beach, Signal Hill, Huntington Beach, the county, the county has a, a barrel tax, uh, which there's additional revenue that could go towards funding these localized studies so that we have information in each neighborhood to make informed decisions on uh, what's the best policy solutions for each, uh, for everyday Angelinos. Uh, and with that, I will uh, conclude uh, my presentation and, and open the floor. All right, thank you, Uduwak. Um As I mentioned earlier, colleagues, um, I think we need the city attorney to provide us with legal analysis on, the, on this issue. So I'm gonna be introducing a um, council motion to ask for one. Um, but do you have any questions, Mr. Kuretz? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a few questions and comments. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Uduak, our petroleum administrator, for uh, his efforts on this, which are voluminous, plus uh, many other things that you've done uh, working with our office over the years. And I want to congratulate you on uh, the position that you've uh, just been offered by the state to, to head the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources otherwise known as Dogger, that's a very significant position. We look forward to working with you in, in, uh, in that position. Uh, a report like this and, and an issue like this really hasn't been done before. Um, in a city where uh, we've had hundreds of wells long before we had development and probably a century of development right near the wells. Um, and we've heard firsthand accounts here and elsewhere of kids with nosebleeds, with asthma, with cancer clusters. Um, and uh, uh, folks expressed a wrong uh, impression that uh, the West Side has no oil drilling sites. Um, it's only because they are well hidden. And that's exactly what the industry tries to do. So. At the Beverly Center, right across the street from Cedar sinai Medical Center, couldn't think of a worse location. Uh, their oil drilling site is largely hidden by the Beverly Center and by some tall walls. Ideally, shouldn't be there. Um, there's a site at uh, Pico and Doheny. Um, most residents think it is probably a religious facility. It has high walls. It has a very tall tower, which is clearly an oil derrick, um, but it has uh, the symbols of uh, the Ten Commandments on all four sides. Um, I just visited uh, a few days ago a shul I haven't, hadn't been to that opened up just a few years before, <coughs> directly across the street at Pico and Doheny. And I'm sure when they moved there, they had no idea that was an oil site. In fact, they told me so. And you can smell the oil in the shul. You can taste the oil, and it's just the accumulation of that pollution. Um, on the other side of that site, uh, there are housing units. Um, I would say probably less than 50 feet away 
and uh, uh, probably 75 feet away in front uh, are that synagogue, the one next door, and uh, a, a Chabad school that probably has at least a couple hundred kids in it. Um, I grew up 200 feet away from there, um, lived there for 20 years. Now my mother, I don't know whether there was a connection. My mother died from uterine cancer, pancreatic cancer, and brain cancer. Um, maybe there's a connection, maybe not. If there is and we could prove it, I'd be pretty mad, to say the least. Um, there are a lot of people are, that are impacted. I presume whatever distance we pick, this site will be shut down because it has so many sensitive uses and it has housing and they're all within 100 feet. Um, there are a lot of questions though. Obviously, this is a different circumstance because every other place in the country that is looking at this does not have this kind of density and especially around all these sites. Um, now I know uh, these were identified in peer-reviewed studies and the result was a recommendation of 600 feet for existing and 1,500 feet for new development. Now if you need to have 1,500 feet for new development, how do we justify only 600 feet for existing other than convenience because it's a lot harder to, to deal with that distance, but is there any actual reason why for existing sites 600 feet is considered adequate? Yeah, in our discussions with the city attorney, there's different legal implications uh, either with the two. So you could combine them into one uh, and, and deal with it in, in one swath, or you can try to deal with it uh, for existing and future has different different impacts. But there's no health connection between either the 600 or the 1500. Uh, no, we just went to what the, uh, the furthest distance before you get to real challenges of uh, other jurisdictions. Also on the amortization period and amount, that seems to me to be way off base. I know there are other theories that uh, all that needs to be amortized are what the oil companies originally expected to make at a particular site. Um, probably every single site has well outstripped that. Um, plus uh, having the date count as today's date or whatever date it is when we pass this instruction um, when without a doubt will allow a certain number of years before they actually have to do that. I would assume that also would figure in. So would not these figures be wildly inflated and is it possible we wouldn't owe the oil companies anything? And in addition I look at some of these oil sites and I say they, they should be just dying to shut off uh, their production and start building luxury housing. And could they not make an absolute fortune at some of these sites where they have uh, large sites where, where uh, you know, certainly tens or hundreds or five hundreds of millions of dollars uh, could be made. So if all those things were taken into account, do we still expect this massive amortization fee to apply? Well, uh, first, this was not an amortization uh, study or evaluation. That portion of the original motion was not advanced or was not asked for. Uh, and so we didn't uh, consider or look at amortization. Uh, that is something that the city attorney report pack can speak to, uh, but that was outside the scope. Uh, these costs are, are potential costs. Uh, depending on how and what distance you, uh, the council decides to go, uh, will have different impacts. Uh, but this was just uh, a potential impact estimation. All of the uh, numbers are in the correct order of magnitude. Um, there could have been other data submitted. There was not. Since the reports come out, no one else has given uh, any other economic studies to counter uh, besides just saying that they don't agree with it. But no one's done any other evaluation. And I think that's really, um, when you talk to the city attorney and the planning department, those are the third party uh, uh, experts and consultants will need to go through and refine. So as you go through litigation, you, we can be very precise. And also, did you consider the fact that uh, 
the oil industry is a declining industry with uh, the emergence and the emergency of climate change and that uh, you have uh, numerous countries and other localities trying to uh, reduce the uh, the usage of oil and gas by 40 to 50 percent by 2030. Um, have we taken into account the fact that uh, this industry is contracting and will continue to do so? Yeah, uh, oil uh, uh, production uh, statewide has been in decline since the 80s. Um, oil decline in Los Angeles has been in decline uh, since the 60s. Um, it's, the, you know, if, if all things are, are uh, continuous, then at some point you'll, you'll hit that, that zero point, but um, they're, they're still in operation. Uh, I mean, on a gross estimate, uh, the producers in L.A. are making about $150 million a year uh, in revenue from oil production in the city. So we didn't take any of that into account? That was... Uh, no, that, w that was not what was requested. But we did uh, evaluate what the production and the decline are, have been. And I believe, um, in terms of the impact on refineries, uh, I believe if I read everything correctly that uh, even currently, without taking any action, uh, around 98% of the oil that's uh, coming into uh, L.A. to be refined um, is foreign. So with 2% of the oil being uh, refined in our refineries being local, um, would that not be a, a very insignificant number that will hardly have any impact on our local refineries? Yeah, we, we are importing about 130 million barrels of oil uh, a year into local refineries. So the 2 million barrels is, is, a, is a very small percent. So uh, despite the concerns by uh, folks speaking up for the refineries, uh, it really sounds like it will have uh, virtually no significant impact uh, in terms of uh, increasing import of foreign oil or making oil less available to the refineries. Yeah, we'll just uh, become more reliant on the imports. Uh, but so we're already reliant at 98% is yeah, my point. Percent. So. We won't become much more reliant. We're already there, and nothing is going to change that except we will reduce our production uh, to some degree. Um, let's see. Did you uh, include the potential financial benefit benefits of having a, a healthier community and a safer community by putting in this buffer? Uh, we, we do have one of the attachments includes uh, an economic study that does outline that, but that was not what was uh, asked for in the direction of the 11 directives, but we do have that as one of the attachments uh, in the report. And also, uh, I think the report said that we don't engage in hydraulic fracking but we do uh, uh, some other similar practices uh, uh, using acid. And uh, how much of a difference is that in terms of uh, the harm that's caused by one or the other? Because I don't want us to think that we have a, a, a crystal clean process and that we're not doing uh, things that are chemically dangerous. Yeah, I, I would have to get back to you on the difference of uh, acid fracking versus hydraulic fracking. I know there has not been any um, hydraulic fracturing in the city of LA since SB4 went into effect in 2014, uh, but I would have to do some additional research uh, to see for acid fracking how, if and how much of that has been happening. And uh, in terms of liability, I know there seems to be a somewhat standard practice on behalf of uh, the oil and gas industry. Um, which is to sell off uh, old wells before they shut them down uh, through uh, shell companies so that they can avoid liability. Is there anything we should be doing to uh, anticipate that to prevent the city from picking up all that liability? Yeah, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, one is create a restricted fund, uh, the funds we have that can be used towards some of those costs. I know my office, I currently have some 
uh, portion of pipeline in CD5 that needs to be abandoned because of the Beverly Hills uh, drill site where the company Vinico went bankrupt uh, and left us uh, and canceled their, they were discharged from the responsibility of their franchise agreement in federal bankruptcy court. Um, so if we had funds, if we saved the funds that we get from the oil revenue, we could do that. Uh, we, another policy proposal could be to create an abandonment fee or an abandonment fund that would be there to match federal brown uh, field cleanup funds um, and, and do those type of things. But uh, a new policy like that would be welcome, but doesn't exist right now. Uh, and even the future barrel tax, a portion of that revenue could go to uh, a, an abandonment fund that uh, the city of Long Beach has an abandonment fund that has about $300 million to help with the cleanup costs uh, down there when they start up operations. I think that's a, a great idea. And one last question. Um, we heard from uh, a lot of uh, union workers today from the refineries. The actual workers at the drill sites, uh, how many of them are union? Um, the, the workers in the port area are U.S. Steel Workers, Local 675. Uh, outside of that, I'm not aware of any uh, other uh, unionized workforce at, at other drill sites. Thank you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank, thank you, Uduak, for this, uh, this report. And I want to thank everyone who came in on their own time to give public comment um, on this very important uh, issue. I have so many questions, but I know it's going to come back, so I'm going to do a quarter of the questions that I had uh, and, just, and just stick to the report specifically. When we talk about uh, health risk uh, assessment at each site, within the context of that, can you define each site, oil field versus drilling site? I think that's going to be really important to answer. In, in, in other words, where there's any type of release related to petroleum drilling, that should be where all of these health risk assessments are conducted. So maybe just dial down on exactly what constitutes uh, a risk assessment site sure. in terms of the immediate surrounding environment. So the, the drilling that happens in the city of LA happens in the drill sites. Uh, that's where the O districts uh, are approved and the planning codes uh, and the, the plan approvals from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s uh, originate from. And do, do those assessments happen at every last drill site existing in the city of Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, every, every drill site has a plan approval somewhere in, in the, the planning records. It's passed, though, it, it, in the past when, when it was approved. Right. So what we're talking about is, is doing a health risk assessment at each site currently. Right, which we have... Um, I want to say 16, sorry, yes, 16 active sites okay. across the city. So what we would endeavor to do is do a risk assessment at those 16 sites. Correct. Uh, fresh, new assessments. And that's what the report suggests as well, yes? Okay. Correct. I just wanted to get... Uh, we need to identify funding. To do yeah. Correct. We don't have any funding for right. that right now. Right. Um, and then in terms of the whole liability uh, risk and the... The, the one page of the report that lists current oil production, future oil reserves, land value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we'll need to do is uh, find out what those exact liability risks are from, um, you know, legal counsel so that we can take a look at, um, for example, when you hear that we're, we're our, we could be liable for up to $100 billion, essentially, nearly, Exactly what does that mean, right, in terms of real liability? It's a very complicated, nuanced issue because drilling sites will expire at different years. Some of them probably have long-term leases that might go indefinitely. So, so that will have to be looked at in, in terms of what it makes sense to proceed with uh, in terms of how we sunset these sites and discontinue drilling. Um, so, so those two. And then something else, Madam Chair, that uh, is really important, uh, and this might have to be in the CLA report, in terms of livelihoods and employment impacts, you heard these union uh, members uh, talk about their concerns. Um, and so I don't want to be cavalier about 
transitioning current workers at the refineries especially um, whose job uh, who jobs their classifications may change drastically in in not the not so distant future so the question is livelihoods that are currently tied to the oil and gas industry how can they transition successfully to other job opportunities with this is really important commensurate pay job security and benefits not just oh well, we'll just transition you into the new green economy which we all want don't get me wrong but we don't want to do that at the sacrifice of income livelihoods uh, etc and I think I think in order for a smooth transition into a sustainable future we have to really figure that out um, no one wants someone to come into or be forced into um, a new field if they're going to be making a fraction uh, of what they were making in, uh, before. So I, I think that specific uh, request could be included in a report back. Um, now's the time to ask those hard questions, to do the deep digging, uh, to do the heavy lifting so that we can move together forward uh, in this new green economy. And I think that's what probably uh, gives people in the industry pause in terms of workers. I'm talking about people who put food on their table for their families. Uh, that's that's of, of great concern to me. But I, I am of the belief that we do not have to sacrifice that to clean up our environment and to move to a sustainable future. But we have to uh, figure out those hard questions before we make that switch and as we uh, move into this new future. And just a little point of... Um, of privilege here is uh, I shared this with a few folks who came in to the office last week when I was very very young living in rural Oklahoma uh, at one point we lived in the middle of nowhere but next to us was a sort of a lay down site of utility poles and railroad ties that had been soaked in petroleum and children used to go and play at, at that site uh, in, in some of our neighbors, uh, my, my mother would never let us do that. But where I'm going with this is for the about year and a half where we lived in that house, uh, we lived with the constant odor of petroleum. And I'll never forget it uh, and how uh, we had to deal with the, the effects of that. Uh, and so we know that um, during the industrial age, that we are starting to emerge from, that there are health effects. And you heard some of the testimony today. Um, so what I'm saying is, I think we on the council realize that it's a very real issue, that we have to move forward declaratively, um, but we also must um, look out for uh, the workers who are currently holding jobs on how they can transition to new opportunities with commensurate pay, job security, and benefits. And I look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offer. I think you raised a lot of really um, great concerns and things that need to be addressed as we move forward. Um, Uruak, do you have anything else to say about the report? Anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, I'd like Thoughts to you want to leave us with? just uh, thank my staff. Erica Blyther is here with me, uh, Sonny Berberade, uh, Dr. Seth Shankov, uh, Leanne Hill, uh, this is a, a two-year effort uh, that really, uh, you know, wouldn't have been possible without a great team uh, to get this report together. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but when's your last day? <laughs> it's uh, undetermined still. Undetermined, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but Mr. Correct, did you have a, a last yeah, another just, question? Yeah, just one quick question on that same front, which is, how is this actually going to impact us once you depart? Um, because we put a lot of things that we wanted to do on hold and didn't begin them until we had someone from the industry that we actually thought was not just a shill for oil and gas, but actually could be objective. Um, there aren't that many people out there. So what do you project in terms of your impact on this process by leaving and how, how uh, difficult will it be for us to find somebody else uh, in that same circumstance? Well, uh, members of your staff have called me the unicorn, so I think it's going to be very difficult to, to replace me. 
<laughs> Somebody calls you the unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But uh, I, I think uh, we, we, I've made a substantial contribution here that the, um, the report backs from the city attorney and from the planning department <coughs> will be instructive of the process going forward, uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's still possible to make policy decisions and move forward on this item uh, in my absence. Uh, I, I still will be a, a public servant with the state of California, so if there's requests uh, to, to the state level that we can be supportive uh, where I can be, I'm, I'm happy to uh, um, make sure uh, their staff or, or expertise available, but um, we have built up and trained our staff in my office. Uh, Erica, a number of our other staff members have done training, have been involved in this process, understand the city processes, so uh, we at least have a foundation. I know in previous reports like this, it was always a report back, we don't have the expertise to even give you an answer, and so uh, we've moved beyond that, and we, ha we have an answer, there's information uh, in this report. Uh, but also city staff overall have been trained and upgraded and planning and fire department and building safety that uh, they have a better perspective on implementing uh, the policy that whichever direction the council decides to go. So you think we have some backup staff uh, existing so we won't have to go back and say all right. You never know. We, we have, have a lot we have of no background. We, we can't move this forward. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right, Uruwakwa, there's a lot of recommendations on this list um, that we can start chipping away. I think, well, there's several of them that are controversial that we're going to continue to ask for feedback from our city attorney's office. But I do want to leave you with this. I really appreciate the fact that so many folks from frontline communities made it out this afternoon. I think we don't often hear from them because they're busy working and putting food on their table for their children. We had two full um, overflow rooms as we were conducting our meeting today. And so I just really appreciate you all being here and, and, um, and taking time from work. A lot of you are working, and you took the time to be here with your children. I was really impressed with the amount of young people that were here as well. As I often talk about, you know, these folks don't always get to come here because, like I said, they've got um, one or two jobs to hold down or kids to feed. Um, kids to get to school, so I want to just make sure that we recognize the fact that they took time out of their busy schedules to be here. We allotted about two hours of public comment. Um, like I said at the beginning of our committee meeting, we're going to keep this item in committee so there will be more time for discussion and more time for public comment. Um, that I just don't want to make sure that people who felt that they filled out cards and were not um, called to speak today, um, we want to make sure that you continue to stay engaged. Um, I've also shared my concerns, and I think I've said this to you, Uruwak. I come from a community where we had to, where we didn't have clean air or, or, or good paying jobs. And it's about time that frontline communities have both. Um, we, we deserve to have clean air, but we also deserve those good paying um, union jobs um, that, are, that are due to these communities. And so um, I really appreciate the conversation and the fact that everybody was respectful. Uh, and we cannot afford to divide each other up. We need to keep moving forward and find a middle ground where we can have both, where these communities finally we make um, repair the sins of the past, um, and we also make sure that our children um, breathe clean air, which they deserve, um, and that their parents have good paying jobs to keep you know, paying the mortgage or the rent and put food on their table. So I just want to recognize that and applaud everybody for keeping it um, incredibly respectful uh, and keeping it moving. So thank you very much, colleagues, for those of you who, I know I've made you late to your other committees and to your other commitments, but nevertheless, I'm gonna move forward with a couple of instructions, if I may. So let's go ahead and continue item one until we get a report back from the city attorney, which I'm gonna um, introduce a motion next week on that issue. And let's go ahead and uh, note and file item number two and approve Mr. Bonin's motion, which is item number three. Are there any objections to any of that? No. Seeing none, that will be the order, and there is no more business before us, so thank you very much. Our meeting is adjourned.